how did the debate that is about to ensue uh, get started? Well, a very interesting way. James Collier wrote a book called Bold Scan years ago. I interviewed him uh, about that book. A chilling book indeed. But James' later work is about the moon. Our moon. You know, the one that was just full here a few days ago. He says, we never went there. And somebody called me. There was a caller to the show. As a matter of fact, well, I'll look. I got a fax from James Collier. Let me read it to you. N then you'll understand how this got started. Dear Art, I read Chris Ruddy's piece on your website. Oh, yes, Chris Ruddy. Uh, it's up there on the website. You might want to read it. Uh, the Pittsburgh Tribune wrote a wonderful article on me. Anyway, he starts, I read Chris Ruddy's piece on your website, and he did his usual excellent job. As a matter of fact, I discussed it with him before he wrote it. In that Chris and I have been friends for many years. Chris wrote the first review of Vote Scam ever to appear. Chris also saw the, in quotes, moon tape, and said that he was stunned. If you know Chris at all, you know he does not use hyperbole. Chris is surprised that you won't give the tape a fair airing on your show. I heard the young man who called you the other night say that he had done a voice reversal on me when I appeared on the Lou Epton show, and it showed I did indeed believe what I was saying. You agreed with him that I was sincere, but you said we believe, uh, that you believed uh, we indeed had gone to the moon and to Mars, and that was that. Art, one of the observations I made to Chris was that you give all points of view dignity. Why is this one verboten? Well, the hairs on that line that go up at that. Verboten? Nothing's verboten here. Nothing. People have tried to explain your behavior to me as being intellectually dishonest. But I can't accept that of you. They say your love affair with Hoagland's theories are bind, uh, blinding you from presenting my point of view. I saw Hoagland's tape. And his theory that a glass city was built on the moon, uh, and that more than puzzles me. First of all, how did they convert the silica to glass on the moon? Factories? Magic? Hoagland claims a glass city was destroyed by meteorites. Why would an intelligent, advanced civilization build glass houses where God throws stones? I'd love to debate Hoagland. That would be a night to remember. Is there still room in your intellectual storehouse for dissenting opinion? Or are you full up? Then the hairs came out another inch. And so, of course, I called James Collier immediately on the phone. Now, I have sitting here two little red lights. One of them contains electronically James Collier. The other contains from his new digs near Albuquerque, Richard C. Hoagland. Engstrom Science Award winner, um, a man who worked with Walter Cronkite when we were going to the moon, question mark. And here's what I want to do. Um, I, I don't want this to be boring. And in presidential debates where one guy gets 10 minutes or 15 minutes to talk, or, or even five, and then the other gets five, it's boring. And so I would like to allow a reasoned interaction between these two parties. It is a, a, not exactly a gray area, folks. We either went to the moon or we didn't. So um, I'm going to bring both of these gentlemen up, respectively. Uh, James Collier, uh, where are you, James? Back east somewhere? New York. New York. That's where Richard used to be. Right. All right. Um, and Richard, uh, you of course uh, are are up there in uh, near Albuquerque. Yes, I'm sitting on a gorgeous mountaintop, and I watched the moon rise about an hour ago over the Sandias, and it is spectacular. Uh -huh. I'm sitting on a beautiful mountaintop, and it's raining like hell. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Uh, the issue is, did we or did we not go to the moon? And again, I would like to allow a reasonable interaction between you, and uh, try and avoid speeches. However. Opening statements would be in order. Uh, uh, James, why don't you begin and tell us why you believe, or at least begin to tell us why you believe, that we never went to the moon? 
All right. Well, first I want to say hello, Richard. Hi, Jim. All right. I spoke when to you. Before. We were we we spoke uh, our, just before I left uh, New York as we were moving out here. Okay. I think uh, James was in the final preparations for his book, and he and I talked, and I had pointed him to some references uh, regarding this this question. And we never got a chance to really get together for me to show him some of the data that we've been working on. And so the book has come out, and unfortunately, I have not seen a copy. I've only heard about it, but I've not seen the book. Is right. there, James, is, is your book out? <clears throat> no, the book is not. So let's start from here. I started to do a book called Was It Only a Paper Moon for my uh, publishing, uh, the company I work for in New York called Victoria House Press, which right. is the same one that did Boatskin. And the way I got that was a guy a great named... great title, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, my wife, Phyllis, uh, figured that one out, who's <laughs> also a writer and co-writer with this on me. Um, a guy named uh, Ralph Rene came to me, and he's quite famous out there in America for a book called NASA Mooned America. That's right. And he had a, 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 he actually came to the publishing company, and he had a transcript called The Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, and they gave it to me. To, uh, to vet, actually, to say, what, what do you think of this? And I had never thought of this in my life up to that point. And so I was really not doing anything, and I started looking into it. And the more I looked into it, the absolutely more floored I was by what Ralph Rene was putting forth. And basically, it was damn good physics, just physics, you know. So uh, I t it took about three months, and then as I got into what he was into, I got questions more than the stuff that he never even considered so uh it was taking too long and ralph pulled the book and self-published it and i understand he's doing pretty well with it himself and uh so i proposed was it only a paper moon to the uh publisher and they said uh all right you go ahead and do it because there i was left hanging with with this incredible story but nothing to do about it so they let me do it and as I started to write the book I realized that everything I was dealing with was visual and uh, I was trying to describe pictures and things and it was terribly difficult so I went into a realm that I'd never gone into which was uh, uh, um, video journalism and I went to a studio here and uh, I got all the NASA film footage of the, all seven shots mm -hmm. And uh, I went to uh, the Space Museum in Washington, and I went down to Houston, but we'll get into more of that later. And, and in the end, I had an incredible amount of footage of stuff. And so I started putting it together in the studio, and then I added a monologue to it and split it up. And basically, uh, what you have is my monologue split up with all the facts and documentation. So that if anyone thinks that I'm just out here with an agenda that we didn't go to the moon, no, I, I just am an investigative reporter who found some incredible stuff and put it all down and then put it out to the public and to NASA and to as many places as I could send it out, including the talk shows and art and all these people, to get feedback because this investigation is by no means over. It is merely just beginning. All right, are you convinced we didn't go to the moon, James? I am convinced we didn't go to the moon, but I, I want to make this clear that I am willing to be unconvinced, uh, and that's one. That's why I called uh, uh, Richard, because I wanted Richard to convince me we went to the moon because I wanted to blow uh, Renee's book out of the water, but Richard and I never got together, so we couldn't do it. So tonight is going to be a terrific night. Well, and he may convince you tonight. Richard's very good at that. Okay, well, and, uh, <laughs> even even if you come to your senses later. <laughs> well, I, I read the Ed Mitchell thing, and I, I saw how he works on your mind. All right, so uh, let us begin with facts, James. Okay. Give me one good, solid fact, for example, that says we didn't go. All right, well, now, the first thing you would do uh, when you went to the moon would be to uh, put a camera on the astronaut, and then you would tilt it upwards, and you would take a picture of the Earth and say, here's an astronaut, here's the Earth. I, if, if they had ever done that, I wouldn't be on the phone with you tonight. But they never did it in six times on the moon. Not a single shot of the Earth from the moon was ever taken except that one famous one that looks very phony. Uh, and and uh, Richard mentioned it in his monologue of, of Mitchell. Uh, and, and, so, and the only shot they ever did take of the Earth was the, the Earth was the size of the moon. And the Earth is four times bigger than the moon, and so people who, 
who uh, criticize, uh, who, you know, who feel we didn't go, say, how could that possibly be? The basic physics is wrong. Somebody didn't think when they took that shot. So that was the first thing. The first, they never did it. That, All right, we better take these on one at a time or they'll yeah, get let's lost. Let's see what Richard has to say. I mean, that. Richard there, what about that? Well, unfortunately, James's numbers just don't, don't add up. Um, in 1994, I took a team of eight people, geologists, photo experts, producer types, media people, a friend of mine that works with uh, Ted Koppel, and we descended on the National Space Science Data Center at Greenbelt and the Goddard Space Flight Center right outside Washington. Mm. And we spent two days going over every inch of the film, and there are tens of thousands of feet of film, both in motion picture form and in the Hasselblad and the pan camera and all the other photographic stuff that was during the lunar missions. And what I was doing was bringing to the lab problems that we had noted in the photography, anomalies, duplicate frames, curious administrative uh, bureaucratic kind of problems in managing the, the resource, as well as uh, there on, being there on a, on a reconnaissance trip looking for new data to either prove or falsify the model that there's interesting stuff on the moon not built by us. And I must have seen during that two days at least half a dozen shots of the Earth from the moon, from the lunar surface, some of which included the lunar module in the shot, some of which included the flag, some of which I think on Apollo 17 there's a shot of Cernan with the Earth above him. And one of the reasons why there's a paucity in the earlier missions of Earth shots and astronauts and moon is because we landed at the lunar equator, basically more or less. And the Earth is directly overhead, which means it's 90 degrees to the horizon, more or less. It was only on the later missions, on 15 and on 17, that we landed at a high enough latitude uh, where you could actually begin to, by bending down and crouching down, which is hard in a spacesuit, get the uh, get the earth in the in the in the in the shot. But James says there were no such pictures except one, which was fakey, he said. No one has ever seen them except Richard. So if Richard well, but, if you could get the reason me a copy no one's ever seen them is because no one's ever asked. One of my problems with the whole Apollo program is if you go to any textbook, you know, and you can pick out a textbook written in sixty nine or in seventy when the when the missions, you know, first really began, or go to a, a textbook written now, an astronomy textbook you'll find the same boring half dozen pictures of the moon. Now, right. is this a conspiracy? Well, that's an interesting word, conspiracy. I think it's a paucity of imagination by publishers because basically they are thinking like Spiro Agnew who, who said once you've seen one shot of Jupiter, you've seen them all. <laughs> they think of a place with craters and holes in it. Once you've seen one shot, you've seen them all. So we'll just keep using the same picture over and over and over again. If you actually go to the archive and start looking through the, the, the pile of images, you'll find all kinds of interesting shots, including all kinds of interesting things on the shots that normally the general public does not does not have access to because they just don't go. So, Richard, you're saying it's just a conspiracy of media stupidity and laziness. Yeah, and I work for the media, and I have a perfect right to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, I asked NASA to show, to give me that particular shot, and I, and I spoke with the people in Houston, and I spoke with the people in the archives. Now, now, which shot are you talking about? The shot of that you said there's a half a dozen shots of the Earth from. Oh, the, at least. I mean, I'm. I'm. Not, that's not a, 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 a complete list. I mean, we just happened to run into about half a dozen in what I was looking for. And let me tell you why I was looking for a shot of the Earth. All right. And in fact, in the Apollo 14 material that I got from Ken Johnston. We got in his archive, which he had squirreled away 30 years ago at the uh, Oklahoma uh, City College, we got three or four shots of the Earth above the lunar module Antares, which landed, I think, uh, three or four degrees above the equator, north of the equator at the Framara region. And Shepard had to stand out in front of the lunar module and lean back as the camera was mounted on their chest packs. So they had to aim with their whole body. It wasn't like they had a had a camera they could move around separately. It was mounted on a rigid uh, uh, mount on the chest of the spacesuit. So they had to lean back and take the picture up the ladder, up the limb, above the antenna, and up into space a quarter of a million miles away. And there's this beautiful frame crescent Earth. Well, the reason I wanted to get the Earth 
which, by the way, in that frame, measured with those lenses, is two degrees across. It is exactly the right size. Is because if there are glass domes on the moon, and there's more than one, Jim, all right, then one of the ways you would detect such glass domes would be by the interference or refractive bending effects of the glass on objects seen beyond it or in a thing called forward scattering, which is the same phenomena when you're driving west at sunset and, and your windshield is dirty and the, the, the sunlight is lighting up all the bugs and all the stuff on the windshield and you can't see out. That's called forward scattered light. So if the Earth is up above a dome or a portion of a glass dome and the dome is pitted by micrometeorite bombardment, you would expect that you would be able to see a halo around the Earth shining through a fragment of the dome, and that's what I was specifically looking for, which is why I went looking for all these shots, and I found tons of shots. Can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, it, it, it is the second important point. You said the Earth is two degrees of the photograph. Yep. Um, if you were to take, with the same camera and exposure and all the rest of it, a shot from Earth of the moon, how big would it be? Uh, half a degree. Half a degree. One quarter of the size. One quarter of the size. Now, the field of view of the Hasselblads, and, I mean, we've got all the all the spec sheets for the, the – they had bayonet lenses, which means they had snapping lenses because they were wearing these bulky gloves, so they couldn't thread lenses in and out of the camera. Mm -hmm. So they had to be snapped in and snapped out. And we've got lists of what the le focal length of the lens were and what the field of view was. And you do all those calculations, the Earth in these shots that I saw – my team saw at NSSDC for two days was precisely two degrees across. All right, James, do you have any argument for that? Uh, uh, one question I have, you, the, the camera that's strapped to their chest, the Hasselblad. Well, it's actually mounted on a metal bracket. Right. Do they do that inside the limb before they come out? I uh, don't know. Uh, probably not because getting through that little door uh, was difficult. And, and, and they, I mean, it was basically a very easily removable, it kind of, it down in a mount so that gravity would hold it in. Right. All right. Now, was it air cooled? No, the camera wasn't cooled at all. It was it was it was coated in white, and there was a, a special film inside that was a higher temperature film than normally is used on the Earth. And the reason I know that is that a very good friend of mine, Charles Wyckoff, who was head of photographic development for E G and G, that's Edgerton, Germis, Hausen and Greer, which is a major aerospace R and D firm which has all kinds of, of, you know, involvement in the military and black budgets and black projects and in NASA. Um, Charlie was approached by NASA before the Apollo program as the chief photographic scientist to develop a special set of films to go to the moon. And one of the criteria was a film that would be low fogging under the ambient radiation conditions expected and would be resistant to the expected high temperatures. However, the high temperatures are highly overstated in most textbooks because although they claim that at noon on the moon is 250 above, above uh, zero Fahrenheit, uh, meaning it would be above the boiling point of water, the Apollo landings took place early in the morning when the sun was 10, 12 degrees. And the suits and the cameras were, were white, so they reflected most of the light and the heat. So the actual film inside maintain very terrestrial temperatures all the time. All right. Gentlemen, uh, James, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that. We're at the top of the hour. Everybody take a deep breath and we'll be back. I presume we are just getting started. Things I realized as I started investigating all this is that every bit of documentation having to do with going to the moon has been destroyed. What? I went to Grumman who built the LEM and every bit of whatever, how... What thought went into building the LEM has been destroyed. I went to Boeing, and I said, what went into the uh, little car, the, ro the uh, rover? And they said, every bit of that has been destroyed. I went to all the archives the same way. And <clears throat> I just asked Richard uh, off the air here, I said, what documentation is there that someone created a film? Because I called uh, Eastman Kodak, and I said, what temperature does film melt at? And they said 150 degrees in the Hasselblad cameras. It would have, they could have never taken a picture on the moon. They couldn't have taken video. Why not? And they could not, because it was 250. Now, let me explain what Richard said. He said, and it's what the New York Times said, 
that they landed on the edge of night and that it really was only a nice balmy 80 degrees like uh, on Miami Beach. Well, first of all, even on the equator here on Earth, as soon as the sun cracks the, the corner, that temperature soars to over 120 degrees. So I don't buy that whatsoever. And secondly, I have NASA video showing them there in high noon with no shadow. And it was 250 degrees, and any film they had, any video, anything with emulsion would have melted. Richard? Well, you know, this is a very complex discussion. Let me, let me go back to my source of my information. I was very privileged back in 65 when I was at the museum in Springfield to one day see a piece of film on, I guess it was CBS or NBC, showing the first cosmonauts spacewalking. And uh, it was Alexei Leonov, the, uh, the Russian cosmonaut who, uh, you know, has now become great friends with Tom Stafford and has been over here so many times and appeared at dinners in the museums and the Smithsonian and all that. Well, back in 65, he was a cosmonaut and the first human being to step outside his spacecraft and float along with an umbilical. And the American press and the American media and even some of the university people were absolutely aghast and the first thing they suspected was that the Russians were faking the spacewalk. So what a friend of mine at New York University did was to provide a copy of the film from the Soviets to an American expert in film technology, Charlie Wyckoff at EG&G, to have Charlie analyze the film. And because I knew my friend at New York University, that's how I met Wyckoff, and he was in Boston and I was in Springfield, which was an hour and a half away down the Mass Turnpike. So I made an awful lot of visits, and I stayed at his house, and I mean, Charlie and Helen and I got to be very, very good friends, and I spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours with Charlie Wyckoff from 65 on. Now, the reason the timing here is important is because Charlie was approached as the principal scientist for EG&G by NASA in between 65 and 66 to develop film to be taken to the moon during the Apollo program. Film that would uh, operate at 250 degrees. Well, among other things, they were, they were far less concerned with, with the film because basically the, the, the temperature at which, which film will melt depends on the base. It depends on the, on the film base. Charlie had developed, all right, film that was used to record every nuclear test in Nevada, not very far from where you are tonight. I know. Right? I know. And... Those cameras and that film required to film nuclear tests a few miles away from a second sun, you know, uh, a megaton, 10 megatons, whatever, going off above, above ground, had to run at over a million frames per second. When Hazel O'Leary and President Clinton declassified those nuclear test shots a few uh, months ago, and now you can buy the video, you, know, you see the late night commercials for the incredible home video of all the classified nuclear tests. Charlie Wyckoff was responsible for developing the technology that allowed us to record a nuclear weapon well, up close you, and personal. Let me ask you a question. Well, Did let he, me finish my point. All right, but uh, let's try and keep it brief if we can and go okay. back and forth here. 250 the degrees. The point is that photographing a nuclear weapon reduces very high temperatures in the camera and on the film. Charlie was able to develop a film that could literally photograph a nuclear weapon. Part of the job description that NASA gave him was, look, give us a film that we can use on the moon, regardless of the time of day or night or whatever. And they were much more concerned with the, with the light characteristics, the ability to record light and the latitude, meaning the ability to record very bright objects and very dim objects on the same frame in the same exposure, they were not concerned with temperature because temperature was a non-problem in terms of film technology even in 1965. All right. Now, did he have a uh, how did did he have a Kodak type arrangement where he could make the emulsion and all that? What he did was he literally at EG and G drew up the specs. He then would go to Rochester. They would literally hand produce in the lab emulsions to his specifications. All right, now stop right there. Do you have any proof of that? I use the film. Do you have any documented proof that your friend uh, made specifications that Kodak built for him? 
Yes, he has. He has Can I get file. that documentation? Because you told me it, and the laboratory was no, destroyed. No, 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 James, don't twist my words. All right, Tell you're getting ahead you of the story. All right. Okay. What he would do was to go to Rochester and and basically say, because it was a very, you know, what the old Boy network is. Before we got so bureaucratized and so rigid, and we had fifteen thousand copies in triplicate, it basically was a guy of Charlie's reputation would walk into Kodak where everybody knew him. And say, look, I've got this contract for NASA. I need a film that will do such and such and such and such. And they would go down the hall. They would sit down. They'd scribble a few notes. And a few weeks later, in the mail would come X number of rolls of this film that they had literally hand produced. And you're telling produced. me that Kodak produced a film that wouldn't uh, melt at 250 degrees and there's no documentation? You have, you're not letting me finish the story, James. Well, you Please, I'm not under interrogation, all right? <laughs> it's not a cross-examination. I'm trying to tell you... It is, though, Richard, fair to ask, um, how would you prove that that was true? Because I'm going to put him in touch with Charlie Wyckoff. All right, that's Charlie's fine. Let's, own let's drop records. that point until I can get to Charlie Charlie's Wyckoff. Charlie's own records are separate from Kodak. All right? Now, now, let me leap ahead of the story. The reason I was interested in the film in later years, long after my association with Mr. Wyckoff, is because... It's the film record of what they shot on the moon and from lunar orbit, which is the basis of our hypothesis that there are alien structures built by somebody that NASA went and photographed and then has hid from the American people and the rest of the world for over 30 years. So the cornerstone of the evidentiary file is a photographic record. If we don't have photographs of those structures, ergo there can be no structures that we can prove. So I'm extremely interested in the photographic process of documentation. That's why I've been pursuing the photographic angle for so long. So you can lead him then to the proof. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Because I was privy to almost on a daily basis the soap opera, and I'm not overstating the case, between Charlie and NASA in terms of developing a lunar film. What Charlie did was to develop a color film that the astronauts could take to the moon that literally was able to record what's called a straight line latitude, meaning the brightest and the darkest object in the same frame that can be exposed and still both be visible, 10,000 to 1 in brightness. Now, to give you some basis of comparison, a normal television, if you point a TV camera, the old tube drive TV cameras in a studio, the, the maximum range you could have was about 10 to 1 between the brightest and the darkest shadow. Brightest light, darkest shadow, before either the light was overexposed or the shadow was underexposed, you would see no detail. Color film, color slide film that Kodak was putting out in the mid to late 60s when NASA was going to go to the moon had about the same straight line latitude. In other words, if you didn't get the exposure almost exactly right, the shadows would turn out too dark, or the highlights would turn out to be overexposed and washed out. And everybody who's ever taken pictures on a picnic or in the mountains or on a vacation knows that you had to be incredibly per persnickety about the exposure settings and the camera settings and the, uh, the, the, the light values, otherwise you didn't get any decent pictures. It's because color film had lousy latitude. Charlie was approached by NASA to develop a stunning breakthrough film that would literally be... 10,000 times better than existing color film. All right, somebody's got a radio on or something. We're going to have to get that off. Okay. Some kind of radio. Um, and so, we did it. All right, so where is that film today? Ah, I actually got to use that film. Where is it today? The film does not exist. The it's film does not wacky. exist because of a very complicated legal wrangle between Charlie and Kodak, because Kodak did not want this film to come out commercially. Why not? Because it basically would have obsoleted every other film they ever had on the market. Ooh, if I, you, you can know. take a picture, if I can give Grandma a piece of, of film, it's just now beginning to quietly come out. If you'll notice, the film is a commercial color film. It's available. The latitude is getting better and better and better. That's because Kodak decided when they basically bought out the the, uh, the licensing agreement from EG&G, because that's where Charlie worked. I mean... His relationship was through, was through EG&G, and, and when you work for big laboratories, your own inventions many times are not yours. They're owned by the company you work for. So EG&G and, and Kodak worked out a deal whereby 
Kodak could sit on this incredible breakthrough 30 years ago and slowly dribble it into the marketplace. All right, but I, th you know, that I have a little hard time with, uh, Richard. It seems to me that if something that dramatic had been invented, you're virtually telling us it's like the 100-mile-per-hour carburetor, a uh, 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 mile-per-gallon carburetor. Mark, that... this is not a second-hand story. I use no, I roll understand. after roll after roll of this film. I, I understand, but to say it does not exist today is incredible. No, 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 it does exist, and Kodak is now beginning to commercialize it. Well, I, I talked to Kodak, and they said there is no such thing. But let's move on. You said that this film was so sensitive. Well, when you go to visit Charlie, and that's what you're going to have to do, he All right. will show you examples. I'll go visit Charlie. I can guarantee you because you're going to put me on to Charlie. He's up He's up in Boston. He's I'll get you to put me on. Believe me, the po I will be back on the Art Bell show with whatever I get from Charlie. Because well, this, this investigation is, is going to go all the way to Congress and Senate, same, believe same. me. This is why this film thing is so critical. Right, and I know. And everything I look for as an investigative reporter has a very interesting way of disappearing in smoke. But let me ask you a question. You said this film was so sensitive. No, I didn't it, say sensitive. I said it was wide latitude. Okay, but you different. said it would take a picture of the smallest light and the brightest light, right? Because well, Westinghouse developed that camera. It's in the Space Museum in Washington. And I have a video. On my video, I show John Young on the moon with a NASA guy saying he's taking picture of the astronomy. And the sky on the moon is black, right? Because there's no atmosphere there, so it's pitch black. But there is no stars in any NASA photo. Why not? Because the stars are too damn dim. Okay, don't go any farther. I don't want to hear that. That's a, too damn dim. You just said that the film uh, was, could take pictures that was so sensitive, and I'm going to get this tape back James, to Martin Bell. James, do the numbers. Sit down with a calculator and do the numbers. All right, all right okay, we won't go any right. further. There no, 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 no. no, no that's, that's, if that's, they would have had any stars James, in any NASA photo ever, it's a wait critical a minute, point. Wait James, you asked a question, I'm going to answer. Go ahead. Stars. The brightest star in the sky, and I wish I had a table in front of me here, so I'm going to do this for memory. Compared to the sun, is probably at least a million times dimmer than sunlight. The film that Charlie developed was only good for 10,000 to one, not a million to one. So you're basically photographing astronauts on a bright sunlit landscape in broad daylight. Yeah, and but you're, no and you're asking, and you're doing it at a hundredth of a second or something. Whoa, wait. And you're asking that film to simultaneously record stars that are a million times dimmer than that landscape, and there's no film that exists that can do that, not even Charlie's film. Then what, what happened to the camera built by Westinghouse that's in the museum in Washington? Because the camera built by Westinghouse was an electronographic camera. It was a low-light-level camera, an electronic image intensifier camera. Then where are the stars? They set, where are pictures finish. of stars? They set, it up, they set it up in the shadow of the lunar module, it was not a chest pack Hasselblad. It was a telescope and camera combination. It was aimed from the shadow up at the sky, and there were time exposures that were not looking at the landscape at all. They were astronomical pictures taken of the deep sky. They were taken of the Earth. They were taken of the Magellanic Clouds. They were taken in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum, and they were time exposures. So, of course, you can record stars with a time exposure, if the astronaut had set up a camera on a tripod and simply opened the shutter and left it open for a second or two seconds or whatever, you would have seen all kinds of stars. But the landscape in bright sunlight would have been hopelessly washed out even with Wyckoff's film because the brightness range is a million to one. But how come the Earth with reflected light got picked up? Because the Earth is 80 times brighter than full moonlight as seen from the moon. All right, if the Earth is 80 times brighter, how much brighter is the sun in no atmosphere? Well, it's probably maybe one order of magnitude brighter, maybe two and a half times brighter as seen from the moon than it is as seen from the Earth. Two and a half times brighter than it is here. Uh, roughly. I mean, that, that's... Two and a half times brighter than it is here without atmosphere and with no diffused light? Well, I'm talking direct radiation. I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're talking perception by the human eye. We're not talking perception by the human eye, right? Perception by perception the human eye with visual. no atmosphere. Right. How bright was that sun? Well, the absolute magnitude of the sun is 27.6 minus 27.6. All right, so it would have been horrendously bright. No, no, no. It would have been perceived to be substantially brighter, but we're dealing with a human visual system in terms of instrument would it, would measurements. It, would a right? camera 
Would a camera not perceive it to be brighter? It would be a few percentage points brighter to a camera. To an not much. Not much, no. So, that in other words... Uh, uh, because remember, the peak of the sunlight is in the peak of the transparency of the Earth's atmosphere, in the blue-green region of the spectrum. So you're That's telling me that the, the bright sun at high noon on the moon... But we're not on the moon at high noon. Uh, but you are, because I've got... Here's oh, another thing. Well, okay, let's move on then. We'll get out no, of no, this. No, no, James, realm. you can't move on. You make the statement that we were on the moon at high noon. Because I got I video from NASA that, we that proves that their shadow is not even their own length. But that's, high noon. Because, that's because you're trying to interpret the photographs without a full data set. Oh, come on. Uh, let me, no, let me no, move no, on no, a little farther. Very important question. Well, Richard, it is an interesting question. If the shadow is uh, virtually non-existent or very yep. tiny, that means, does it not, that the sun is roughly above you? Or it means there are refractions that are filling in the light. There's no refraction without atmosphere. How about a glass dome, James? Oh, okay. Well, let's move on. No, let's we're not going to move see, on. I'll because that is a your glass key dome. part of the model. Okay. You are you are basically asking American people to believe, if I understand you correctly, that there is this vast conspiracy that twenty billion dollars and four hundred thousand employees conspired to basically sucker the American people into believing. We didn't go to the moon, but we spent the money. I'm not asking Richard, the American people to believe anything. I want to move on. Before, before, you you move on before you move on, Richard, I've got something to say to you. You, in effect, Richard, are asking uh, the American people to believe that every bit as large a conspiracy occurred with as many people um, uh, to uh, hide from us the artifacts that are on the moon. Not at all. Because the number of people who were on the moon were 12, and the number of people who handled the photographs in Houston were two or three. So we're talking 15 people versus 400,000. No, originally wants to try and tell us about how the guy was born who invented the film. So uh, somewhere in between is where we probably want to be. Um, let's not leave this sun angle thing for a bit, uh, just a moment. It, Richard, how can you explain? Uh, you know, the lack of a long shadow. I mean, it d doesn't that indicate the reference point of the sun to the, the human being standing there? Well, all right, this conversation needs to have a larger context. All right. right? It is my contention and the Enterprise team, of a whole lot of different people who looked at this now over the last half decade, that A, we did go to the moon, and B, NASA hid what was there. Well. And the, in the process of hiding it, I am absolutely willing to agree with James there are some very bizarre photographic anomalies that demand explanation. Some of the explanation that we have been able to figure out is the anomalies are caused by the very unusual lighting conditions on the moon, which is not as it has been represented. The moon is not an airless sphere covered with rock and craters where the sun beats down with nothing in between. The moon in this model has interesting glass stuff sticking up here and there, and that glass stuff, if you land close enough to it to explore it, which apparently is what we did in Apollo, will refract and interact with that sunlight and will cause a very bizarre light patterning on the surface. And if James wants to come out here to our lab, I will take him for hour after hour after hour through all kinds of photographs that not only I but other of my colleagues have been looking at that show these light patterns unequivocally because we've looked now at the database, the vast okay. database at NSSDC. Okay, Richard, but... Number two, you, number two. But wait, before you go on to number two, then, your explanation is the only way the light or the shadows could be the way they are is if you account for the glass structures. No, no, that, I said that's one explanation. And what's the other? The other explanation is that because this was in the late 60s and early 70s, 30 years before the rise of computer technology, if you wanted to fake a picture... If you basically wanted to hide something so obvious that you couldn't do it in a computer because the computer didn't exist yet to do it, you'd have to fake it photographically. So some of the photographs that I think James has looked at that show remarkable anomalies are, in fact, studio shots. <laughs> I they agree. They were done in a studio, but that doesn't mean we didn't go to the moon, James. It means... It's part of a larger pattern of hiding what was really there. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. And uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, we have to make a decision. Now, Why uh, would I, they do? Okay. I, okay, so now, because of your theory, you, you can slough this. You are so good at that. Uh, one of the things in round one. Theory, you we have wait, evidence. Let, hey, let me talk, because you filibuster. 
uh, you said, Art, that you gave it to him because of the camera thing. He sloughed it again. I said that I wouldn't be talking to you if they'd have taken the video camera, put it on the astronaut, tilted it upward and said, there's the Earth. I wouldn't be talking. They never did it. End of that case. I don't care what they did with their chest cameras. No one's ever seen those photos. Now, uh, when you, when another thing they would have done. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that the Ed Findell, who was running the TV camera on the rover from Houston, yeah. you claim there is no uh, tape, videotape, of the video camera being used to photograph the astronauts and the Earth simultaneously. If there is, NASA will not give it to me. Well, I got it. Well, you send it to me, and I will show it to Art Bell. Huh? You send it to me. Okay. Okay, I'm, uh, we'll be back on the Art Bell show again. If you can produce that tape, send it well, over. I don't I... understand why it's significant, because well, I can well, take a TV shot like because I can take a film shot. If, if you'd have done that, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd have said, there's the moon, there's the Earth. We'd have seen it on television. Cronkite and you would have been real heroes. Wait, 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 James, neither one of you James, guys did James. that. Are you telling me that because something's on television, you believe it? I, no, I don't want to debate that. No, Here, no, it's a very important question. question. Just because you no, don't I see a TV television shot, you don't and news, believe it? If you read my book, you'll know that I believe that the news media, the New York Post, Washington, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, and the media is as corrupt as you can get. So the answer is no, I don't believe it. Okay, so why is this shot so important? Because that would have then proven we went to the moon. No, it wouldn't. Well, to me, it would. All it would do is prove that somebody had put a goal. I mean, I was in charge well, to of simulation. People who are not CBS. as sophisticated as you are, we would have believed it. James, I was in charge of simulations at CBS. We actually made Earth models. We photographed them on TV above models of the lunar landscape as part of our simulation. And did you have a lunar a lander in the CBS studio in New York? Yes. I know. Well, actually, it was out of Bethpage. That's part of my story. That's it very was, it true. It was out of Bethpage, Long Island, where Grumman was. Exactly. You did. You, everything was exactly what duplicate. Uh, and what you said is true. It was done here on Earth, and they did fake the video. One of the things that can prove well, it. Well, uh, believe me, we had a budget of several million dollars for these shots. Back then, that was Why a lot of money. Why didn't you tell us that? Then? And, and during Apollo 12, when Alan Bean pointed the TV camera at the sun, so we suddenly lost all live TV, which uh -huh. now, yeah, right. in hindsight, I think is incredibly suspicious. Mm -hmm. um, we had to go for the four or six hour space walk, you know, the EVA, with simulations that I had designed at Bethpage. There's a famous picture of Alan Bean taken by Conrad, or Conrad taken by Bean. It's a, you see it everywhere. It's the astronaut in the suit. Yep. And what, what you see is the camera is mounted on their chest. But Art, if you have that picture or ever get to see it, it's in every book and it's in advertising. Yes. The camera is taken from two feet above the head of the astronaut shooting down on his head. How did they do that? Well, because one astronaut was standing on an elevation, the other astronaut no, it was wasn't. standing in a you hole. You can see in the reflecting plate of the mask that the guy's wearing in the gold plate that he's in front of the limb on a flat surface. No, he's not no in front more of the than limb. 12 feet away because you can see the shadow. That shot a good mile away from the limb, over the, so over you the horizon. You can see the pods of the limb in the reflection that's, of his mask. That's not the limb. That's well, the structures. That's the artificial structures that are in the faceplate reflected, James. You mean Go to our website, www.enterprisemission.com. Okay. They look just like the pods of the one, but all right, I'll give you that. Look uh, at those and so they were sent on our website. The picture was still supposedly taken by the man standing across the room with a camera on his chest, and it's taken from above. How did they do that? Because it's not taken from above. And one standing on, is standing on an elevation, and the other one is standing in a depression, and in fact, it appears to be, if you analyze the photograph carefully, that the depressions are part of a foundation of a structure on the moon. And if you also analyze it closely, you'll see there's two shadows, one coming from in back of one of the astronauts and one coming from in back of the other, like there were two suns. No, it's the, it's the curved faceplate. It, in, oh. it introduces severe distortion. It's like photographing flamingos in one of those lawn ornaments oh. in Florida. Boy, the anomalies are never ending. All right, now, one of the things I would have done, we're going to get back to shadows in a minute because that's vital. One of the things I would have done to prove that I went to the moon was I would have taken a handful of dust, thrown it in the air, and watched it go up 60 feet in the air. Why? They never did that, ever. Ever threw anything in the show anti-gravity. Have you, seen, gravity. have you seen the film of the rooster tail from the rover on the ah, Apollo 16 oh, mission? Oh, I love you, sir. You know, I talked to... Uh, the head 
uh, the guy in charge of astronaut training, uh, he's on my video. Art, can I tell people how to get this video? Of course. Look, this video is so important because when I asked this guy, uh, his name is uh, uh, Frank Hughes. He's in charge of astronaut training then and now. The well, only guy left from Apollo. I said, how, what have you got that proves we went to the moon? And he said, the rooster tail and back of the rover. And so I analyzed I'm that. a dummy. One of you. What is the rooster tail? Okay, now, the rover's the little car that drove on the moon, and when it moved along, it spit, you know, like a, a speedboat spit. It had wire rooster. wheels, Art, and it picked up lunar dust, and like a centrifuge, it spit it out it behind it. spit it out the it. back. It's called a rooster tail when you go water skiing and, right. or a boat, you know, a speedboat. Right. The dust water. particles will fly out tangential to the wheel rotating. I can do, I can do that with my Jeep on the beach. And, and they will fall in a parabolic arc, and in a, on a place where there is no air... They will follow a Newtonian trajectory, and it should be a very classic example of objects moving under under gravity. Well, in this what case, under a different gravity. If there is no gravity on the moon, how should that rooster tail have gone? Well, there's actually one-sixth gravity on the moon. I know. If there's no atmosphere on the moon, how should that have gone? Well, it depends on... Remember, these were wire mesh wheels. How should the dust that have left the wire mesh wheels gone? Depending upon the interaction of the dust and where the dust is picked up and the rotation of the wheel yeah well it will it will it will look somewhat like a fan all right it will not look like a like a stream of water arcing because all the dust is not catching up the same radius from the wheel all right let me give you the law of physics uh, uh mr uh, Hogan. the law of well, physics wait, wait. Is... these were not solid wheels they were it wire doesn't mesh make a wheels, damn bit of difference means the, that the dust physics... was picked up between the surface of the wheel and the and the axle, uh, all the way down to the axle. Don't go look in the mirror tonight. Your nose is going to hit it. Uh, the uh, the when the dust comes up from the James, wheel. I don't think that kind of comment is appropriate in this discussion. All right. All right. I, I'm sorry. I took it back. I just exasperated for people who 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 think that you're giving them uh, this is junk physics you're giving because I'm going to tell you what no, I what said. I did was to actually measure the pendulum swing of one of the sample bags on Apollo 17. No, let's go back. To and the I room. also was the person that proposed on Apollo 15 the feather and the hammer. that Scott dropped the hammer and the feather. Are you aware of that? Sir? I sure am aware of that. And I but let's go back to time the both. Boy, you still and back. the gravity on the moon is one six. Now you can claim that they changed the film speed or the tape speed, but if that's true, then they had to somehow sync up the live transmission with the with the uh, with the no, uh, visual yeah, like we you saw said, on why? The television. Why? If it was all done in advance and it was phony, what difference does that make? That was easy to do. What they couldn't do. Let's talk about the rooster tail. You're tale. claiming that if we saw a picture of the Earth from the rover camera, you would buy that we've been to the moon. They could have faked that too, as I said before. Well, so what? That's true. But let's talk about the rooster tail, because I know you're ducking this. The rooster tail. No, I'm not ducking it. I'm saying that it's a more complicated problem than you're going to lay out. Okay, I'm going to tell you the wheel. I'm going to tell you the uncomplicated problem. The law of physics is that in no atmosphere, wh whatever goes up at whatever speed it goes up, it must come down at the same speed. Even here on Earth, you shoot a bullet in the air, it will go up and it will come down at the same speed. But in no atmosphere, the dust from in back of that little car should have gone on an arc like a rainbow. At the top of the arc, it should have continued down at the same speed. Wait a minute, James. Yes. I'm not a scientist, but if you fire a bullet into the air, yeah. uh, you're firing it at a uh, much faster speed than, than, than uh, terminal velocity, much faster. I uh, know. And, and so when it reaches uh, its arc and begins back down, it is going to attain nothing more than terminal velocity at best. It's going to go up and come down. Once it hits that arc, it's going to come down at exactly the same speed that it went up. It's the law of physics. It does not slow down on the re returning arc. Yeah, but no, 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 no. And if it goes no, straight no, no, up no. and stops, no, 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 no. When it's going up, no. When it's going up, it's being propelled. It's being shot. And so that doesn't make any difference, Art. Even though it does it, even though it's propelled. Is that matter. Richard? Is he right? Actually, James is right on this one. Okay. If you have, if, if you have an impulsive, uh, uh, if, if if you if you add energy, momentum to an object impulsively, like an explosion or it's flung off like like a wheel, it will rise in an arc, and he's absolutely right. It will descend at the same velocity and hit the surface at the same speed at which it left the surface. 
All right, now. That's in the dance. ideal. Let me dance. But that's with only one particle. All right, no. When, no, you're, no, when all... you're riding on the moon with a wire mesh wheel, you're collecting several hundred grams of dust, and you're flinging it backwards, and the dust is colliding with itself, James. You're not allowing for what's called equipartition of energy. Yeah, right. Well, and let the me dust finish. The dust that's colliding with itself is going to fall out faster, so you get a fan. You don't get a rainbow arc. You get a fan of material. Some falls out sooner, some falls out later, and and also it falls to both sides because it's not kept on the same track. Now, now look, here's what happened. It's a much more complicated real-world problem. You're right. Here's what happened. In, in, when I slow, in the video, I slow it down, I speed it up, and you can see it. What happens is that all the dust, no matter where it goes up or which part of it, goes halfway up the arc, just like on Earth, and then it gets hung up in atmosphere. And it forms a sea fan, just like a ring, like the, uh, a circle, uh, a C. Make a C with your thumb and forefinger, and, uh, and, it, and it forms like rings in back of them. In other words, it got hung up in the atmosphere, and it couldn't go any farther because it was done on Earth. And I say that to Frank right on the film, and I called NASA, and I talked to Dr. John Lawrence, and he said, you really savaged him with that one. And, of course, it was true, and any now, physicist looking will Lawrence? know that that, that is, James, stuff in is, back of the rover got hung up in the atmosphere and formed what looks like sound waves. In who back is of, you Dr. Can see John him. Lawrence? What? Who He's the Dr. head of Lawrence? media for, for uh, NASA. He's what? Head of media at NASA. Uh, not familiar with him. Okay, anyway. So anyway, you can't miss it. It forms C rings in back. It doesn't complete the arc because it, it didn't have the energy to go through the atmosphere any farther. That's consistent with atmosphere. And I don't care if you try to tell people well, now, wait, wait, that wait. physics if, on if, the moon is different minute, than physics wait, 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 on the Earth because it is not. Wait a minute. When, have, you, have you compared side-by-side -side footage of the lunar rover doing this? With, uh, you know, uh, the dune buggy hot rodders somewhere out in the Mojave Desert. Absolutely. I've seen it my have, whole life. But have you compared it on the video? The, the video the, that you'll see. Well, have look, you done the same right, Let me tell people how to get this video. I'm going to forget. No, no, no. Have you done the comparison side by side, split screen? No. Why not? Because I don't have the capability. Nor did I care to. Well, wait it's a minute. It's so it's, obvious it's, to it's, anybody. If, if you're it. claiming that the moon... That they, in other words, you're claiming they were down on the moon, they were on the Earth, and they were doing this in some, some in back lot. It night. is so obviously done in atmosphere that the physics of it is quite obvious. Then why not compare dune buggies on sand dunes with fine particulate matter and the lunar rover stuff side by side? It'll with come the, out the, exactly the, the same. Screen. I've seen it myself in life. I know many times. No, I, I told you I got a Jeep. I've done it. To play fair, you have to show your That's viewer. True. Well, uh, you know, I didn't have the, the money to do that kind of thing. Wait, but a split screen? I, I don't have it. I don't have the kind of money you got. But wait, you're making an extraordinary claim, and it's not there is a friend of mine who at all. Claim it's very the extraordinary basic claims physics. demand extraordinary evidence. It's not. Well, I, I would know, think that comparison this is, is not a part of your case. This is not extraordinary. It's quite obvious. Well, let me, now, let me you tell you one more thing. Let me tell you one more thing. Well, on I, I want to ask you a question. Uh huh. You're claiming this then proves this was done in an atmosphere. In atmosphere, no question about it. And I have other you, people who know physics see it. And anybody you, who sees it knows it. Have you asked someone with a vacuum chamber to set up a centrifuge so you can spit out dust and analyze what happens under one gravity? Because gravity should simply change the length of the arc. It shouldn't change the basic dynamics, right? That's correct. So if you, do it, if you do it in a vacuum chamber... Is it possible you might get interesting interdust effects that would mimic an atmosphere, but it would in fact be a different no, physical in, phenomenon? No, impossible. Why? Impossible. Because it would go against the laws of physics. Wait, 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 wait. How do you know the laws of physics? Because I was taught them. No, the reason we went to the moon was to discover if we need to add, add to our laws of physics. Okay. If, let me we, move on. if we There's knew everything else. there was in the universe, why would we have science, James? Okay, let me ask you. are claiming that we know everything about ballistic flight and that we don't need to do actual experiments and compare side-by-side -side examples because we already know what we should expect to find. All right, I'd love to do it. Now, uh, here's so, two things now. We So far, we didn't take a camera and put it on an astronaut and show the Earth. They never took anything and threw it up in the air to show that there was no gravity, it should have gone uh, six times higher than on Earth. Never once did they ever do it. And the 
rooster tail behind the rover looks exactly like on Earth, and I slow it down and stop action it, and you can see it. Art, can I please give this address? James, uh, uh, we're near the top of the hour, so okay. when we come back, we, look, we have the luxury of time and radio. Don't uh, worry about it. Okay. Uh, you're going to get a chance to um, uh, give out information on how to get your tape so people can see this, and right. maybe you'll even have time to get a side-by-side -side photograph in there. Uh, you can get it, Victoria House Press in New York, and if, you're, uh, if you've got my book, Vote Scam, that's the same place you get it. And it's in the phone book. Uh, don't get Victoria House Apartments. They're, this, they're in New York, too. Victoria House Press. Have you got their phone number? Yes, it's 212-809-9090. Uh, 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 and it's at 67 Wall Street. All right, the phone number is probably more important. Okay, 212-809-9090. Uh, uh, one, one, right, there's an 800 number for credit cards, which is 1-800. Really easy to remember, 888-9999. 1-800-888-9999. That is easy. And it costs 23 bucks. 23 that bucks. That includes the shipping. And when you're done viewing this, you'll know we never went to the moon. Right. It's a 90-minute tape, and nobody has ever seen it, including hard-boiled newsmen I've shown it to who ever again believe that we went to the moon. All right. Uh, hold on. Now, to be fair, uh, Richard? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you, you have materials, too. Well, I don't want to talk about materials, so I want to talk about something that's yeah, coming up. If you want, okay. We have a, a, two major announcements tonight, and I guess Los Angeles has now joined us. That's right. That's right. That's uh, right. A few weeks ago on your show, we did a rather remarkable historical thing, which was a simulcast on your show from Phoenix, on the Internet, et cetera, et cetera. We are holding a sequel in Pasadena on September 11th, which is a little less than a month away now. That night, at around 6.30 California time, Pacific time, the second NASA spacecraft headed for Mars arrives. Mars Surveyor will be put into orbit. The deorbit burn will take place at about 6.30 California time. Yes. What we have planned, what the Enterprise mission has planned, is a double whammy for that day. We are going to do a demonstration outside JPL in the morning, beginning between 9.00 and 11 a.m. when there is a major briefing on the upcoming insertion burn and all of the press and other uh, NASA employees and scientists, whatever, will be gathered in the Von Karman Auditorium. So if you would like to participate in this rally, right. which is basically to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that Sidonia is rephotographed now from the surveyor mission, right. um, I'm going to be there. I don't normally go to demonstrations. I'm going to go to this one. Okay. And I have an information number. If you want to call David Laverty, who is our kind of uh, rally coordinator, okay. he is at area code 408-356-1430. That's area code 408-356-1430. If you want to be there or be square and to show, you know, NASA and the press, CNN and everybody else, that people care and would like to see this issue resolved. Okay. Now, the second event is going to be that evening at the Double Tree Hotel in, uh, in the nice part of Pasadena, about a mile away from JPL. We're putting on a five-hour intensive that evening, starting at about 7 o'clock. And Ron Nix, who is our geologist on the project, one of them, and Ken Johnston, who has been on your program many times, yes. former NASA expert, uh, test pilot, uh, currently at Boeing, will join me, and we may have a couple of surprise guests, and our discussion for the evening is going to be pretty groundbreaking, because we have been, since our last program, several weeks ago, looking intensively at the Pathfinder imagery. We have had some major breakthroughs in this 15-year quest to find out what the heck NASA is really up to. And that will be all presented. That will be all presented. There is an information number for that event, which is that evening, so you can go to both. All right, and that is? 310-967-1377. That's area code 310-967-1377. There will be a lot of information on that line. We're going to have some astonishing photographs, Art, and you have seen one of them. You have seen a photograph of a pyramid, a three- or four-foot-tall pyramid I have, yes. lying a few feet away from the Pathfinder lander. I have also discussed with you and with Ron how in other photographs taken from the lander 
that object has disappeared. I know it. James, you think that that has only been playing games with the moon? All right, hold on, guys. Hold They've on. They've been playing games with our heads for over 30 years, and on Thursday night, the 11th, we're going to have the convincing proof, finally, of what they've been up to, what they've been hiding, and we may have, if things break just right politically, a couple of very important surprise guests All right. that night. All right, all right. Both of you then have made your announcements. Um, uh, here's something from uh, my webmaster, Keith Rowland. Uh, with regard to the uh, discussion we're having prior to the top of the hour, Keith asks, hey, what about Alan Shepard's golf ball shot? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, in the parking lot at Johnson Space Center in NASA, when I spoke to Frank Hughes, I said, hey, I saw that golf ball go. And he said, well, you're trying to get me. He said, because nobody ever saw that golf ball go. It was taken from the side, and I have NASA's video right here of it, and he's correct. Nobody ever saw that golf ball go anywhere. Well, if I anybody have, has any James, video of it going, then James. Hughes is a liar, because I believed I saw it go, and it looked like it was on a string. James? Yes. I have an even better mystery for you. Uh-huh. Have you read Shepard's book, Moonshot? I just finished it, and it stinks. Oh, well, forget the quality of the book. Have you read the book? Yeah. Have you, looked, have you looked at the photographs? Yeah. In the centerfold of Alan Shepard's book, there is a double-page spread of the lunar module and Shepard and Mitchell and the golf shot with the golf ball suspended photographically in its flight outward from after Shepard hit it. Uh -huh. Remember that shot? Yeah. That picture is a total fake. I know. Well, now, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. This is what's all important. Fake. Alan Shepard, in his own book, now we spent a lot of time trying to track this picture down, right. trying to get a NASA number for it, because as soon as I looked at it, I knew it had to be faked, and here's why. There was no third film camera on the moon. Right. There was a chest pack camera, a Hasselblad on Mitchell. There was a chest pack Hasselblad on Shepard. And there was a little TV camera sitting on a tripod about 20 feet away from the lunar module to the north, if I right. remember correctly. Right. The angle of this shot, which is the center fold in Shepard's own book, is of photographic quality. In other words, it is a, it's an actual photograph. It's not a TV uh, picture. Right. But when you begin to look at it, I can show you from the photographs that Ken provided me from 14 from his private archive where he squirreled them away, the photographs that were used reversed in the computer. It is a completely fake computer shot, and they've taken a little picture of Mitchell from his putting up the TV camera shot flipped it in the computer, matted it into the scene, drew the, the, the shadows from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, and, and the, the um, S-band antenna that was sending the TV signals down to Earth. Right. In other words, they've completely doctored this picture, and we got hold of Shepard's secretary, who'd been the one to provide the photographs to the publisher, uh -huh. and we could not get a number. She claimed she had no idea where this photograph came from. And that's where we had to leave it because the, 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 the trail literally runs out. Now, right. here's, here's my problem. Why would Alan Shepard, first astronaut, admiral, bemedaled, you know, American hero, and et cetera, put an obviously fake picture in the middle of his own book? Because he never went to the moon. He's faked everything. He's made his money off of it. And the man is as guilty as you can get. And he well, has no wait, conscience, and that is, the that, is one, conscience. that is one hypothesis. Yes. The other hypothesis is that Alan Shepard and a lot of other NASA people, including the ones we're discussing now uh, the Pathfinder problem with, are desperately trying to leak information so the cavalry comes over the hill and rescues them from this thing they're caught up in where they can't tell us what they really Wow. All right, well, let me tell you a couple things here then. Don't talk for a minute. Because, uh, one, that article you got, uh, Art, was by Lloyd Mallon. You're correct. It was in, in, And I have the entire article. And Mallon was one of the top investigators in America. He had government clearance, and he went to Edgerton. And they 
approved, and, and, it, and it's all documented with a CIA, FBI, Edgerton, uh, uh, universities, Kodak, everybody, that you could see the wires of the, astro of the cosmonaut who walked in space first. It was a fraud, and the reason they did it was for political reasons to shake up the United States. All right, Richard, how do you respond to that? Uh, he's saying the Soviets did take their uh, spacewalk. Well, the guy who did the analysis for EG&G, Charlie Wyckoff, told me, showed me, that at the end of the day when his work was done, he felt that Leonov did spacewalk. They were real photographs. And so that's a complete 180 from what this man has just represented. Well, I can I can read that article to you, and the next time if I do but the show, Lloyd I'll read Mallon, to Lloyd Mallon's, and it's uh, the, it is but the. But you uh, are depending upon the honesty and integrity of Lloyd Mallon, who unfortunately is no longer with us. He that died is correct. But the honesty and integrity of Lloyd Mallon and his documentation is all I can go on, and it's pretty heavy. Well, well could, uh, so what are we talking about here then? A fake gap between the Americans <laughs> and the Russians? That yeah, we, that the Russians well, could take it better. Yeah, right. Well, here's the thing. That's come well, right. Jim, then let me ask you this. Do you think that Ed White did the spacewalk from uh, from the Mercury, from the Gemini capsule I on, think on that, Gemini 4? I, I don't know because I can't go any farther, but I'm, uh, they're probably doing it now, so they probably figured it out. But in the space race of 65, which I'll get to later and how this all started, uh, I think the Russians faked that, and then the Americans took that clue, clue realizing they could do that and pull the wool over people's eyes, and therefore, by 1969, when they didn't have the technology to go to the moon, because I haven't even discussed the LEM yet, uh, they said, hell, we're going to lose $30 billion, and we're not going to do this. And uh, the question is, Walter Cronkite and you had to have known that. You knew it was faked in studios. You were a big science writer. The people at the Post, and I, believe me, for people who have... I haven't even begun to give you the guns yet. Jim, <laughs> let, me, let me be clear. You are accusing me of knowing that NASA... Fake you said that you moon. knew that in CBS, which I found out. Uh, do you know Jim Scott? No. Yeah. Okay, well, Jim told me. He says, I walked in the studio, and I saw the whole fake thing there, and there was one in Dallas, and it was an exact moonscape with a limb on it, and they were doing simulations. And we used to super, I mean... My director and I used to have words because he insisted on putting up simulation every time we went to those shots. And I said, Jim, I said, you're, 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 you're destroying the artistry of the moment. We can get away with a few shots where we don't have to have CBS simulation. Boy, here on the Art Bell Show. Because of standards and practices. Here I, on the Art Bell Show, I got an admission that I have been looking for. I have been, I went to the, the uh, Broadcast Museum. Do you know in the Broadcast Museum in New York, they have taken all NASA video film away but one little clip? What kind of admission are we thinking we've that, 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 that you knew, and so did Cronkite, that you were doing just what you said you were doing, and nobody Everybody was writing knew. about it. We put a super on the screen that said CBS News Simulation. Oh, is that what you're saying you did? That's what I'm saying we okay. did. Uh, uh, all right. And I kept quibbling with my director because he kept putting it up there, and I said, leave the shot so we can see what the damn... You know, I was why, proud did they, of our why did they go to that elaborate lengths to put that into a studio like that? Because we wanted to make sure that if the TV camera broke, and it did, we would have a backup. Remember, television is pictures. And, in fact, it was very boring. Seeing our guys out on that set at Beth Page for hour after hour when there was no live TV for the moon was one of the most boring television experiences of my life because we only had the air to ground. We had the live radio coming back from the moon, but we had to to use our own guys in their, in their fake spacesuits on this simulated lunar surface, and we've kept putting up CBS News simulation. And, of course, the drama of the moment goes away when you don't have actuality, when you don't have real pictures. All right, let me go into something else here that will interest you. When they, uh, what we've established, did you say that L.A. just joined us? They didn't hear the first Los two hours? Andro that's right. Los Angeles joined uh, at midnight. That's correct. Okay, so they didn't hear the first two hours of this. No, that's correct. They did not. Okay, so let me, in, in 30 seconds, I'm going to tell them this. Well, you can't, you don't have 30 seconds. You will when we come back. We're at the uh, bottom okay. of the hour. We spent a lot of time giving out numbers and information okay. and stuff. All right? And recap, let's hear that. All right, for my friends in L.A. Uh, basically, it's uh, a debate between Richard and I, and I have a 90-minute videotape out called Was It Only a Paper Moon? 
and I'm claiming that we did not go to the moon based on what I've discovered and put on this 90-minute tape, which we'll give you how to get in the next hour. And uh, what we've established so far is that I claim that one of the reasons, uh, if you'd have gone to the moon and taken a video camera and put it on an astronaut and tilted it up and said, there's the Earth, I would have believed we went, but they never did it. Richard debated that. All right, let me they stop never it. Took hold it. Hold it, James. Let me stop you right there. Right. Here's a fact. It says, here is the photo that James Collier claims can't be found. In five minutes, I found it. Where at, is it? At http forward slash forward slash nix.nasa.gov. Uh-huh. Can't Mr. Collier perform a single web search? The picture reference is image number AS17-134-2038. It shows Harrison Schmidt, the lunar horizon, the Earth, and Old Glory all in one shot. I know. That's the one shot taken. And I, I said a video camera. That one shot, I don't believe. That's the only shot ever taken, and it's always there. It's standard. All right. And that, but, uh, and that James, earth and that shot James, is... let me ask, you know, given the state of the art of television in 1969, which I was obviously intimately familiar with, given the fact that we were doing simulations showing the earth above our lunar landscape here on earth in the simulation, why do you put so much importance in Ed Findell pointing the camera up and looking at the earth? In fact, there is video of him doing that. And I have looked through hundreds of hours of this stuff looking for other evidence of the things that we're pursuing. And, you know, I will provide it to you. But to me, it's almost, it's almost a non sequitur because so you got a shot of the earth on the TV. If you think they faked it, why wouldn't they fake that too? I, I totally understand that, but I don't have it. And in my investigation, that was just one of the points. If I think, you, know, you and I both agree they faked a lot of video. No, All right. I said they faked some. I didn't say a oh, lot. Okay, I mean, some. I'll take some. Very careful on a case by case basis to make the decision. Okay. Then the other thing I said is they never threw anything up in the air to show one sixth gravity. Actually, the go- they did. They threw equipment. There was I a, know. There was... I got that video. It huh? went. It went horizontal to the ground and out of the picture, and it never went up in the air. And the guy says, "What's that proof of centrifugal force?" I've got that. I got all. Seven NASA video uh, shots, all seven Apollo well, runs. You know, it, it sounds to me like you wished you'd been the director standing behind Infandel in, in Houston telling the astronauts what they should do to prove to you they were on the moon. Hey, listen, I asked a kid in grade school, I said, what would you do? He said, I'd throw a ball in the air and put a video camera on it. They never did it. That's all right, while saying. we're on that subject, gentlemen, uh, here's another faxer, Phil in Houston at NASA, who says the following. Art, you were right. Both of your guests were wrong. Terminal velocity is a limiting factor in a projectile returning to the surface of the Earth. For example, a bullet shot vertically from a high-powered rifle can have a muzzle exit velocity of 3,000 feet per second. When that bullet falls back to Earth, it will have at most a velocity of approximately 60 feet per second, or terminal velocity. Anybody? Without an atmosphere. That's because of air resistance. Yeah, the ask him what it would do without the atmosphere. The model was on the moon without an atmosphere. The, the, the man should listen more carefully. Right, J- junk science. Uh, okay, so anyway, we've established. Let me move on now. For you people in LA, get the tape. I was talking about Earth, so. Right, right, but but the well, for Earth, you were right, Art. But right, we're talking about being on the moon. Yeah, right. in a vacuum. All right. In a vacuum. But, uh, so let me ask this point. Right. Remember the hammer and feather. Yeah, drop. I spent it, a yeah. lot of time getting NASA, not being in NASA, not being at CBS at that point, but just being me. Right. through friends and colleagues to get the astronauts to actually drop a heavy thing and a light thing on the moon simultaneously right. as a replay of the old Galileo experiment. Correct. And on Apollo 14, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, David Scott, actually stood there with a geology hammer and a falcon feather, symbolically representative of the Air Force Academy and the falcon lunar right. module, Right. and he dropped them and they hit the lunar surface simultaneously. Now, the rate at which they fell is one criteria. And I've looked at the tape, and I've measured the velocity acceleration, and it's about 1.6 g within the limits of measurement. Correct. The fact that they hit the surface simultaneously, a heavy steel hammer and a feather, indicates to me that it was done in a vacuum. Uh, No, I, I... 
I've got a, a feather here, same one, and it will fall at the same rate as the hammer. I did it, and I've demonstrated it to people because I got tape? the feather. Is it on your tape? No. No. Nothing you claim you, you've proven is on your tape. Yeah, but what Galileo's law, tape? wait, Galileo's law is James, consistent. what good is the tape if you don't put your proof on your because damn tape? Because Galileo's law is consistent, so I didn't deal with it at all. It's consistent. Something will drop on Earth no matter what its weight, the same speed, 32 feet per second per second. Is the same. It doesn't make any difference. Wait the only thing minute. that won't What will about be... that terminal velocity? If a bullet will reach a terminal velocity, a feather will reach a much slower terminal velocity because it's air resistance per unit mass is yeah, much but greater. Yeah, but not a feather with a quill like that. I've got the same feather, and believe me, it falls put the it same video. rate as the hammer. It Why will... didn't you put it on video if it proves it? Because I didn't want to deal with what was already obvious. Let me go on to things that I do have on video. Okay, here's a, here's a really... Let's just deal with shadows right now real quick, and then we'll go on. One of the things that gets you into this game uh, of investigating this, the people who bring you into it. And there's a lot more people than me doing it around the world. There's a BBC documentary coming out, David Percy in England. There was a story in 40 and Times, three months in a row. Anyway, uh, is that when you, I got the NASA video, they land the limb. The limb is 32 feet long, 33 feet long. The shadow it casts is 33 feet long. It's one time its length. They step out from the shadows. And their shadows are 18 feet long, three times their length. How did that happen? It's on the video. You can't miss it. And they did it in, in Apollo uh, uh, 11, 12. You, you, it's in, you can't miss that. Their shadows jump to three times their length. And then within an, an hour walking on the moon, it goes to less than their length. In the same uh, uh, video, uh, the, uh, demonstrably fake. Well, no, wait a what this proves is that the photographs have been tinkered with. But that's what we've been claiming all along, that the photographic evidence is a critical part of the evidentiary case that NASA is hiding something huge. Why would they tinker with that? Because that's what they're hiding. In other words, if, if, if you have to take shots in a studio, have you ever done a movie? During filming, there is a person who is consistently tagged or tasked with looking for inconsistent detail, minutia. Is the book on the edge of the coffee table tilted at a certain angle? Are the lamps lit in the proper sequence? Are the candles the same length that they were in the previous shot? Stuff like that. But they're claiming this was done real time, really happening. I know they're claiming that, but we already know that that claim is not true. All right, well, then we agree on that point. NASA video is demonstrably... The question, James, please let me... The question is whether or not we were on the moon, and toward that end, please, both of you listen to this, from Brett in Austin, Texas. As much as I distrust and generally dislike NASA or whatever it's become, there can be no doubt we went to the moon. The, uh, the, there is actual physical proof that men were there because we left something there. Well, several somethings, but one thing in particular that can be verified easily and has been verified, that something was a hexagonal-shaped mirror designed so it bounces light back uh, exactly in the direction from which it came. The McDonald Observatory in Texas bounced a laser off the mirror on the moon, which we left there in order to measure extremely precisely the distance from here to there. I forget the details, which Apollo mission left it, but it's there. All right, now, I've dealt with that. In, in the uh, 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 guy who, who did the moon thing, uh, oh, why do I draw a blank? Anyway, they should have put a reflector on there. It it should, it, they should have put it where any astronomer could have seen it. Instead, what they're doing is saying that you need a laser beam to do it, and you've got to be in the government to prove it. They could have put it there. The Hubble telegraph, uh, telescope has never photographed all of that garbage we supposedly left on the moon. Uh, and and um, I don't know why that is. Why well, is that? James, James, the Hubble could not see it because it's very tiny. Um, when I was with Cronkite doing the site surveys, we went out to the Lick Observatory, which at that point was the second largest telescope in the world. The largest was the 200-inch in Palomar in Southern California. And I had the thrill of my young lifetime at that point because I was able to look through the 120-inch at the moon. Very few astronomers ever look through a huge telescope these days because all of the work is done electronically and by computer and CCD and chips and all that. But I actually got to look through the 120-inch, and the reason was that the 120-inch was being prepared that night 
in a supporting role to fire one of the laser beams at the retro reflectors that the Apollo 11 astronauts, Armstrong and Aldrin, were to set up during the Apollo 11 landing. Several of the missions carried these uh, retro reflective packages, including the Russian Lunokhod missions with the reflectors built by the French, and many observatories all over the world, not just government, have bounced pulses, laser pulses, even amateurs have been able to time the distance between Earth and Moon firing pulses off these little corner reflectors. So yes, the, the, uh, the faxer is correct. That is absolute proof that something is on the moon that was not there before 1969. Which didn't mean man went there, but let me ask you this what question. Was that? It doesn't mean man went. The name I was looking for was Jules Verne in his movie going about going to the moon uh, in his book. Uh, said you could have put a giant reflector there where any telescope could have seen it. They could have done that, but they didn't do it. But that's very anecdotal. And whether uh, an amateur can fire a laser beam, where's an amateur going to do that? Where? By having a large telescope and commercially available lasers. The technology has moved on in 30 years. I mean, I could go get myself a laser beam and a telescope that'll do that? Well, it would cost you a bit of money. Okay, well, but there are there are commercial firms. In fact, I was in Seattle talking with a friend of mine about doing exactly that, and he was talking with a major corporation, I will not mention which one, that wanted to basically use a laser beam uh, to, to write on the moon a sign that everybody on Earth, half the Earth, could see. That's the power of lasers now. All right, but this so does that, that kind of laser pulsed off the little reflectors through an amateur telescope could easily be picked up by amateurs. James, uh, let's go back to something that was quite contentious. You said that uh, if what you believe is true, and we did not go to the moon, right? Richard Hoagland would, ha would have had to have been part of the cover-up with Walter Cronkite. Correct. I mean, I'd, uh, based on what Hoagland claims he is, he would have to have known something there. First of all, we do have him admitting that NASA video is faked, and I don't know if he knew it then. I've just learned it now because I've studied it, but he was around then, and he could have looked at this video, and I haven't even brought the big guns out yet. In well, bring state. out the big guns. If you've got big guns, bring them out. Okay, now, well, one other little gun before I go there. The famous uh, shot of the Apollo, uh, of the uh, lunar lander on the moon in Apollo 16 has no crater underneath it, and it had a 10,000 pound down thrust engine. And it should, and it doesn't even disturb a pebble underneath it. Why not? It should have blown a big crater. Actually, that is not true. When okay. I looked at the Apollo 14 photography, which Ken 16. provided me, which oh, was 16. first generation, and it's very important that we compare apples with apples and apples with oranges. And I wanted to look at this pristine, you know, film and photography, which had been kept in a vault for 30 years. One of the key things that I looked at was the close-ups under the descent engine bell of the blast effect on the lunar surface from the descent of Apollo 14. Because obviously, as with James, I have been questioning every single facet of the lunar program, uh, looking for inconsistencies, looking for where NASA is not telling us the truth, looking for ways in which I could calibrate or test this model that there's things on the moon they don't want us to know are there. And one of the things I found out with the close-ups that I had never had access to before was a radial striation pattern on a relatively hard pan surface where the, where the descent engine, as it came down, it blasted out radially, very light stuff. And in fact, you can see wind streaks radially extending out from the engine bell, but you do not see the crater. He's absolutely right. Now, why don't you see a crater? The answer has to do with the consistency of the lunar surface in, in opposition to the models of the lunar surface before we got there. In other words, it's very interesting to argue theory over fact. They thought we might sink into lunar dust. That and was just Tommy disappear. Gold's idea, but even the more benign models said there would maybe a fluffy layer and that the descent engine coming down in a vacuum should basically scoop out a, a crater. Well, what you got to understand is that in a vacuum, where you don't have a constraining atmosphere <clears throat> like on Earth, a rocket exhaust is not a pencil uh, beam of fire coming out in a directed blast. It, in fact, is a sphere. As soon as that exhaust gas leaves the engine bell, it expands as a sphere in all directions. So the pressure per square inch on the ground is relatively small 
compare it to the same test carried out in an atmosphere here on Earth. Yeah, but Is still, 10,000 10, pounds of down thrust, I don't care what you're telling me, it was only a foot or so off the ground. And the famous picture that anybody can go to their book and look at shows you no striations at all. Well, and all the I, will put, video. I will put the photographs up on our website of the striations under the Apollo 14 because I specifically looked to see if we could see that evidence. And it's there. It's not on Apollo 16. Where did you get in the... Well, what? but remember, we landed at different places on the moon. The I know, but it doesn't make any difference. It's not they... homogenous. It's heterogeneous. It has different characteristics. No, but that's the... why we ostensibly went to different places. I know, but the soil, they took soil samples. They, they, they hand-pounded a core into the ground three feet, so we know at that point. In some places, and they had incredible difficulty pounding it in a few feet away in other places. Then how, uh, there's another question we're going to deal with, but that's geology. But let me go to something else here because that's going to be a debate. Those people who want to believe that a 10,000 pound down thrust engine holding up tons of metal on the moon isn't going to blow away a crater under the Apollo 16 shot of it that's in everybody's book in their home that they it can didn't go blow look a crater at. on any of the missions. The what? Look, at, look at Apollo 11, look at 12, look at 14. It didn't look blow at a crater, right? Huh? Didn't, it never blew a crater. There are no craters under the engine bell. There is a pattern of striations on a very hard pan-packed surface. James, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, the crater question. Right. If we were going to set out to fake the whole moon landing business, right? and the operating assumption was... Excellent question, Art. That, no, yeah, the, that, the, that, that there was a lot of loose material and there would be craters, then wouldn't we fake craters? Yeah, it would seem to me they would, but they didn't. <laughs> That's what it would seem to me so they would do. So what does that tell you, James? Well, now, wait. Are so dealing you... with dumb engineers? Well, wait, I haven't even begun. Let's, let's no, 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 move on, and I'll show you it. why I'm, I'm going to show What it. does that tell you? It... Well, ac according to a guy named uh, uh, David Percy in England, who's putting David out a book Percy called Whistleblowers, is an agent he for said MI5. Is... I will what? trust David Percy as far as I can throw him, which is not very far. All right, so I won't discuss David Percy. David Percy is not a reliable source. He is part of the cover-up. And okay, if Art well, wants, I will spend the next hour describing a no, meticulous no, no, detail. No, 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 In terms of that. Oh, okay, we'll move on, we'll move on from that. And I, the, I imagine you will want to move on, yes. Okay, then uh, we, we will not. Okay, now, when I started investigating the LEM itself, uh, oh, well, wait, one other thing. What do you know about the Van Allen radiation belt? Here comes a big gun. Well, I know that they are donut-shaped. I know that they are trapped by the Earth's toroidal magnetic field. I know that they're fairly high radiation, but if you transit them at very high velocity, 25,000 miles per hour, you can go through them quickly enough that you get a very small, minimal radiation dose inside the command module. But how, how from, from where, how high above the Earth does it start and how far out does it go? Well, the inner belt, I mean, this is back in the 50s when we measured these. The inner belt starts, uh, oh, maybe 500 to 600 miles up and extends outwards to 10,000, 15,000 miles, something like that. Okay. And the outer belt? Well, the outer belt is composed of electrons and it varies in intensity. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. It depends on solar flare activity, the loading factors, um, the phase of the moon even has something to do with it. But it all depends. Radiation dose depends on the amount of dosage and the, and the rate at which you fly through it. We right, flew now, through the Van Allen belts at very high velocity. We were, what, what, 26,000 miles an hour? Well, it was, it was decreasing as you're obviously falling uphill. Right. So you're, uh, you're going to spend at least a half an hour in the lower, most deadly part of the belt, right? Wait a minute. Let me uh, push this button. Gentlemen, now I think you're back on the air. James? Uh, am I on? You're on. Okay. Um, the radiation belt goes around the Earth, and what it is basically is the Earth is a magnet, and if you put a magnet in a bowl with iron filings, one half will attract the filings, the other half will repel. So the Earth repels uh, its magnetic force out at about 400 miles up, and then it, it just has this incredible up to 100,000 miles uh, uh, of magnetic field, and it traps the solar radiation from the sun. And uh, now, what do you think of James Van Allen? Are you asking me? Yeah. Well, we call the Van Allen belts 
uh, the Van Allen belts after James Van Allen, who was a physicist at the University of Iowa who put uh, a Geiger counter on the first Explorer spacecraft wafted by Von Braun into orbit after the Sputnik debacle, and uh, the meter was pegged off scale, and we found that there was trapped radiation in the magnetic field, and Van Allen was the guy who did the experiment, so the belts are called after his name. All right, now, uh, Van Allen uh, wrote that his first report in Scientific American magazine in March of 1959. And again, he wrote in Science Something magazine in 1961 and reiterated that everything he found in 59 was the same as 61. And what he said was that the astronauts would have to travel very quickly through it. And even though they traveled quickly through the belt, they'd have been in there uh, of, uh, anywhere from, uh, uh, what, six hours. Uh, they would have needed extraordinary uh, uh, protection meaning lead in the spaceship, and the problem was they couldn't boost a spaceship with lead off the ground. Now, what do you think of aluminum as a prevention for radiation? Well, it depends on the kind of radiation. Um, radiation in the belts is in the form of, of two kinds of particles, primarily protons, hydrogen nuclei, and electrons. Electrons can be stopped easily by, by uh, aluminum and or even, you know, several sheets of paper, depending upon their, uh, their, their velocity and the energy. Okay. The protons uh, are harder to stop. But sometimes low-velocity particles are more damaging than high-velocity particles because low-velocity particles will get trapped and will produce secondaries, which then puncture... Or, or penetrate, you know, vital biological areas of the human body, whereas high-velocity, high-energy particles go right through, almost like a, like, like a pane of glass, and very few of the particles interact with the, the organism and therefore leave radiation damage. Right, and so uh, I, also they found out that when those particles hit metal, they turned into x-rays. That's depending upon the energy and the strength and all that. Look, there are numbers and papers covering all this. What's the bottom line? All right, so anyway... Van Allen says this in his paper, and it was standard up to that point, 1961, that you could not travel through the belt. He didn't say paper would stop it or that uh, aluminum would stop it. He said you needed extraordinary uh, protection from radiation in space, the solar flares being trapped on the, in the Earth. Well, he's introduced a second variable. We're talking about the constant belts versus what happens during a solar flare event. The Apollo astronauts did not go to and from the moon during any solar flare event. As a matter of fact, in 1972, it was one of the worst flares ever done, according to the, uh, 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 the material uh, that Ralph Rene gathered. And it was but not during material. an Apollo mission. Yeah, it was, right during the mission. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about it. So anyway... He didn't say that. He didn't say you have to, uh, don't worry, don't go when there's no flare. It's always there. It's the northern lights. You see it. at the aurora borealis, you see. The bottom line, James, is what is the radiation dose? Give me a number. Okay, now here it is. According to the standards on Earth at the time, it was something like you couldn't get five REMs in a year or a lifetime. And to go through there, uh, the, the military and Van Allen determined that it was 100 REMs an hour. So three hours out and three hours back would have given you 600 rims no matter when you went through it. And so I interview, and no, oh, let me go for one more time. Now, 1965, in Aerospace Medicine Magazine, there is a report in March of 1965. Uh, and it says that, that, that the military decided that they would get the radiation standards totally eliminated from the astronauts. It was called gain over risk. In other words, what would kill a person here on Earth, what they claim would, they said, look, we're going to drop all the standards because we can't go through the radiation belt if we have any. Uh -huh. So we're going to drop all standards. Okay. And let them go through. Okay. Uh, and then uh, it said that uh, they tested all kinds of stuff and they decided that aluminum would stop radiation. Well, I've talked to people who know radiation and they said aluminum would stop radiation in a pig's eye and that the that it would just as van allen said convert the the uh, the, the uh, to uh, x-rays 
coming through and it would have killed them. Eyeballs, testicles, all of that. They never could have made it through. So what they did is they set up two criteria that they needed in order to pull off this hoax of going to the moon was get rid of radiation standards and what Van Allen and the military said would kill you if you tried to get through it and make aluminum a protection against x-rays and radiation and gamma rays that are coming from the sun. And so there they were. Now we can go to the moon. So I called James Van Allen at Iowa, and I interviewed him. He's 83 years old, uh, uh, um, Professor Emeritus, and I said, they trashed your report in a Scientific American magazine that you wrote in 1959, and they named the belt after you. And he said, well, I didn't write the report. I said, what? what do you mean you didn't write the report? And, and he said, my students wrote it. I said, then you, why did they name it after you? He said, well, actually, I did write it. So he, right there, I know I'm dealing with some problems. So then I said, but dealing he said, with what? problems. Because the man reversed himself right there on me. Now, well, allow for the fact that he's how old? 82? 83. 83. And a lot okay, of work I'll allow by for the professors oh. is done by graduate students, Jim. You know that. All right, so wait, well, wait. We're going to go a little farther. Now, so I said in your first paragraph in that, in 59, in your last paragraph in 61, you said that even though astronauts would travel, have to travel through it very quickly, to would not die, and that they needed extraordinary protection in order to do it, meaning lead and that there was a booster problem and that NASA has not been able to find a way to boost a craft that had lead protection, like when you go to the dentist's office and you need a lead vest when you do x-rays, they're going to have a real problem going to outer space. And he said, it must have been a sloppy statement. I said, what a sloppy statement? He says, well, it was written in a popular magazine, and the Scientific American's been around since 1845 and it's hardly popular magazine. And it was a, a popular a statement. So I said, you, you're tell, you, this is junk science you're dealing with. If it was written in another magazine, you would have told us the real truth. And, the, and basically I said, uh, Dr. Van Allen, your belt is a paper tiger. Or you're yielding to NASA and you've been told to keep your mouth shut. He says, I stand by my original statement. They would have been killed. And so I got a mercurial man, and anybody can call him over there, and you can interview him, uh, uh, Richard. And uh, he, he reversed himself for NASA in order to get through the belt that is in the textbook saying it'll kill you to go through. And the only place that it doesn't say that is in this uh, aerospace magazine of 1965, and in, in December 1969, uh, 1969 that uh, aerospace medicine magazine, so that NASA could have an excuse to go through the belt. I, I still don't quite get the point. The point was that Van Allen, who said you would die if you tried to get through the belt without lead protection, reversed him, uh, kept his mouth shut all well, these years. Jim, who made Van Allen God? I mean, oh, well, that's what because, I said. That's what I said to Van just Allen. Because, well, no, no. Just because he found something doesn't mean he did accurate measurements. Maybe. No, the military did the measurements. They well, put it no, up on the Explorer were, 1 and were, 2. James, there were all kinds of spacecraft that we sent on cislunar trajectories between 1958, when Explorer 1 went up, and 1968, when the first Apollo, Apollo 8 went around the moon. Those spacecraft carried all kinds of measurement instruments to actually measure the belts, not theoretical profiles, but actual measurements at different times, different, you know, solar flare activity, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that the radiation is high does not mean it was lethal. Now, here's the question I have for you. Okay. What is the ratio of cancer in the human population in the United States as a whole per 100,000? Hmm. I, I don't know. Well, but that's a key number. All right, right, Richard, if you know, give it to us. Well, I don't know it offhand either, but here's how we can test this model. The radiation is there. Apollo had to go through it twice. Once on the way up, and when they came back home, right? Right. Which means if it didn't kill them outright, if they had some kind of drugs, and we can discuss that because I happen to know there was a very active program, uh, and Ken Johnston, Art, was a part of that program in Oklahoma, which you might want to ask him sometime, a very intensive medical program to develop, among other things, anti-radiation drug therapy 
to keep them from being killed. That was part of the NASA that we've only just found out about. But assuming that that only forestalled immediate death, the long-term problem is cancer, is it not? Correct. Sure. All right. And, we've, got, and, we've got how many astronauts that went to and from the moon, Jim? Well, no, I'm, I'm saying we have zero. How, how Otherwise, many, you have how seven, many you have six times, from the moon? You have six times three. Seven times three went through the belt. Twenty-one. Oh, twenty-one. How many of those astronauts have died of cancer? I'm saying they didn't go. They didn't even get skin cancer. They how didn't. many of those astronauts have died of cancer? None that I know of. You're wrong. Well, I think one did, yeah. James Swiger. Swiger, right. That's right. Died on Apollo 13. He came home, ran for Congress, and died of cancer. Correct. So one out of 20, how many? 21? Right. So in, in, a, in a random sample of people in, in your neighborhood in America tonight, is one out of every 21 people dying of cancer, or is the statistic much greater? In other words, my gut feeling is that the death rate from cancer for astronauts as a as a as, as a unit, as a population study group, is much higher than the average population, meaning but that point, they did point, point suffer well some point, kind of deleterious environmental effect. Right. Point, but, but, point but, well made, Richard, but I have a question for both of you. Right. Uh, if you agree on the dangers of radiation, Richard thinks they withstood it or took some damage from it. Right. You think we didn't go at all and it would have killed them. And the right uh, But both of you, I would ask... Right. Uh, what's going to happen when we go to Mars? We're not going for that reason. And in the last Discovery magazine, that's exactly what they wrote. They said Golden's biggest problem is he doesn't know how to solve it. Richard? Well, that's a very long, complicated answer. Uh, having to do with physics, hyperdimensional technology, the real space program, we can't get into that tonight. But, that, but, but that, with conventional... That is, that is not a showstopper. With right? conventional science right now... It's a stopper. In other words, uh, it, 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 well, on a long-term trip to Mars, yes, presuming the belt problem is not a problem, the long-term trip to Mars, there's always been a concern with solar flares and extensive discussions about shielding versus other things. Let me give you just one example of how you can solve the problem. Uh, remember the ABC uh, demo, the the hyperdimensional physics, the excess heat. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Electricity from space, a la Gene Mayloff, is coming up fast. If you have a lot of energy, what you do is you create superconducting magnetic fields. You shield your ship in a magnetic bubble similar to how the Earth is shielded, and you basically, you know, deflect the radiation, which is not, particle, is not electromagnetic, it's particle radiation, away from the vessel. Mm -hmm. That means you have to have a big spacecraft and lots of power, but that's the way you're going to have to do it. All right, all right. Um, um, James, if you've got other big guns, I think that was a pretty good one. That's a hard one to answer. Uh, well, about the radiation. Right. It, 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 it does open the, the, the door to the following question. In the model that we did go to the moon, which is my model and most Americans and, and most uh, reporters, um, if you were waiving the radiation dangers, if literally you're writing in the literature three years before you go, that you're going to send them regardless of whether it kills them, then that raises the important question, what is so damn important that you would risk the lives of these test pilots regardless? Right, risk over gain, right. And a risk over gain. And the answer is an extraterrestrial civilization waiting to be discovered. All right, now, my, the, the point is that the Earth is being protected from this solar radiation by the belt. No, it's Mars not a is deal. The belts are a byproduct of the field. The belts are a secondary problem. They're I know, not a the, primary protection. If those belts were not there, all that radiation would kill us. No, if the belts were not there, the belts would not be there. You know, we're just a cart before the horse. Because of the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, the charged particles from the sun are deflected and go into little spiral orbits around the field lines, correct. creating the belts. And, and for, no, no, the belts create the they get, protection. They're, they're, they get trapped in it just by virtue of they exist. Well, the, they're coming through the universe and getting trapped in the radiation, the, ra the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. Well, but I don't understand. They're your also point. going through on, on the moon too. Well, what's the same the point? group. Because when what you go to point? the moon and you're walking around on the moon and there's no belt to protect no, you, you're getting was, direct radiation. By the time you get to the moon, the Van Allen belts no longer exist. I know, but the radiation from the sun is still there, as long with Mars and all the other the, planets. The background radiation, particle radiation from the sun is non-existent. There right? might be risk, I suppose, from a flare. 
the, 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 the flare is the big problem, and there were no flares during any Apollo mission, regardless of what Mr. Rene says. And Mr. Rene is not exactly a sterling source. Mr. Rene confuses silhouettes and shadows in his book on photography, so I wouldn't really put him in a court and no, swear to I know Rene personally. I've met him. I've vetted his book, and I know where he got his sources. He got it directly, and what they wouldn't give him is the x-rays. All right, gentlemen, hold it right there in Albuquerque. Then the Russians would have exposed it. After all, we were in a race to the moon with him at the time, and certainly the Russians were no dummies, uh, unless you want to contend that it was a fake gap and both sides were kind of trying to come up with best fake pictures, which I presume, Mr. Collier, is what you believe occurred. All right, that's exactly right. The reason the Russians didn't go and didn't try is they understood the Van Allen radiation belt would kill them. That's exactly correct. And even if they did print it in what, the communist paper, do you think that the American press was going to copy it and translate it from Russian and tell us? Give me a break. All right, you said Richard was part of the cover-up. Uh, here's uh, Rob down in uh, Phoenix who says, hey, Art, if Richard was part of the cover-up, then why would he put the photos under a microscope and tell everybody about inconsistencies to prove his claims about the artifacts that are there? This proves he's on the, quote, outside, end quote. Anyone involved in hoaxing the landings would not be asking the world to look so closely at the pictures and videos for mistakes, in quotes, proving a cover-up of what they saw when they were there. I, I agree. I, what Richard is, I haven't really been able to determine, except he's damn smart. I know that. And he knows uh, his stuff, but there's a lot of holes in in, in uh, w what he's trying to say. Yeah, but if he was an insider, he wouldn't have been doing all this. I know. I, I, un I understand that. But what he is admitting is that the video was fake. And, and what No, is, I said some of the some pictures of have been altered. Okay, when now, but here's what I... the video was fake, that's such a blanket statement. Well, wait, the... then let me point this out, because as I point out, in the NASA video, in, in, in my tape, was it only a paper moon? This 90-minute tape we're here talking about. Uh, uh, Art, can I get that 800 number one more time? 1-800-888-9999-$23. You can get this tape and see what I'm talking about. I took all the NASA video... And it's analyzed for you right there, all seven shots. And the you problem, can... Jim, is you didn't do what I did when I put on the UN tape, the 30-minute extension of the so-called STS-48 UFO footage. Uh -huh. so side by side, I put the anomalous object seen from the shuttle in September of 1991. I saw that. And on the right-hand side, I put the ice crystals floating between the S-4B and the Apollo Command Service module en route to the moon uh -huh. and showed how the motions were totally dissimilar. In other words, a visual comparison for television. Twice now I've asked you, have you done that visual comparison on your tape to prove your point, and you said you couldn't afford it. I know, but well, here's a 90-minute can... tape is not cheap, I know, because I've done a few. Yeah. So how can you put out a 90-minute tape and not provide the best well, evidence. Wait, I'll give you what I've got. Believe me, this tape is just the beginning of my investigation. Because remember, I did it to send to NASA. So what I've got is the analyzation of what I do have. And several of the things I do have, we've already talked about the shadows that obviously show you that they keep altering themselves on the moon's surface. And when they walk out from outside the limb, their shadow... The limb is uh, one time its length, and they go to three, and then it goes to less than their length. But... That isn't the thing. Now, when well, you wait, wait, wait. We have already documented that NASA has a lot more footage than it's publicly admitting. There are 11, maybe 12 now copies of one Apollo 10 frame, AS-4822, uh, AS-10-3242, uh, uh, 12 different versions all masquerading under one frame number. That means, if you use that rule of thumb, there's 12 times more film that we haven't seen. So when they put it out in various formats, I can see where they might get a bit confused. All that proves is there's something weird going on. You know, Jim, look, you, you strike me, particularly when you wrote that first book, Vote Scam, as a pretty decent guy out for the truth. What I want to know is why not once this evening have you even raised the possibility that our model for this weirdness might be right 
and that what you could be seeing is part of a bigger problem. I was I, and that the government went and found out something extraordinary. And because of people like Pat Robertson, remember how the show started? Yeah. We have a man claiming that people like you and I who think there's something out there should be stoned to death. Well, not quite true. He couches well, that he by said saying God that's should what, do it. But come on, right. let's not avoid responsibility here. Pat Robertson. He said that God it, said that. Time. He said that God said that, but. It's still a problem. All right, let me answer It's a big that. political problem because it is the thesis, the contention of the Brookings report, that if NASA ever found what we think they found and are going to prove they have found on Mars come September 11th, Thursday night, in Pasadena, and the phone number, if you want to come, is 310-967-1377. If that's true, if NASA has been hiding all of this, because of people like Pat Robertson, then the weirdness, Jim, that you have found is only the tip of the iceberg, and I, I wish we would join forces I agree. to find I agree. out the real weirdness going on here. I agree, Richard. I couldn't agree more, except let me give you a few more guns, and then we'll deal with that. Here's just some of the things I found. On the video I analyzed, you can see that the, the, uh, you can see the limb, the, that ridiculous thing they call a craft, going along the surface of the moon horizontal. First of all, that thing was sitting on a 10,000-pound rocket holding up uh, thousands of pounds, and it had a little 100-pound thrusters at the top. It never could have moved horizontal to the ground under any circumstances. It would have been like a fat person sitting in a chair, and when you pushed on the shoulders, they would have tipped over. Its only purpose, even in life, was to to supposedly keep it from pitching and yawing. It could never have moved horizontal. Now, when you see the graphics... I point out quite clearly in, in some of the shots, in one shot that will really blow you away, Apollo 17, they go up to the top of a mountain on one day and you see the rover up there. And they come down the mountain and you see the series of rocks. And one I call an alligator rock because the shadow in the rock makes it look like an alligator mouth. The next day they go to a different mountain that's miles away there's no uh, uh, rover at the top, and they come down, and it's exactly the same mountain, the same rocks, everything. It's a total embarrassment. Then you see the you see the uh, in the the uh, horizon on the bottom of your screen never moves as they take off from the moon. The top comes flowing into you in some ridiculous form of graphics. But once pointed out, you see that the bottom never moves. A crater that was a certain size remains that size, never disappears, never goes away. Oh, wait a minute. I looked at hours and hours and hours of footage, again, for reasons quite different than you've been looking, and I have noticed none of these inconsistencies. But look at my tape. You I've will noticed see it. other inconsistencies. But, I mean, we're all drawing from the same pool of footage. Well, I understand it, but I'm telling course. you. Now, wait, wait, Richard, let me finish. I have looked at the it. ascent footage from the lunar module taken from the DAC camera, mounted in the window, looking down. And one of the problems with that footage is that you're flying upside down. Yeah, but so you're you looking see... backwards. You're not looking forward. You're looking behind you. No, but in the one where you see them taking off, and you see them taking off in several, I'm, what I'm telling you is true. When they're landing, what is supposed to be a dust storm, you can see is demonstrably a, a, a phony light rays, taken like, like taken underwater, and they're not coming out in the proper striation from the center of the rocket. You can see it. And, and, and you can see like a little crater, and they land, and the little crater's still there. Nothing fills up. You can see that's phony. You can see all of that is phony. But that is well. Even... Look, this is your opinion that no, it's phony. No, but you can't miss it. You cannot I have... miss it. Look, we have a team. The Enterprise Mission has a team of experts in a wide variety of disciplines. We have NASA people. We have geology people. We have imaging people, computer people. There's a there's an imaging guy in Los Angeles named John Stevens, who's a very good friend of mine who I have had dub off from the original Apollo 10 film, the Apollo 14 film, the video, in a very complex telecine, which he has literally reinvented, and drove 3,000 miles by himself in a, in a van to sit at Goddard and look at original film and transfer it for this project. And I have looked at hours and hours and hours of this footage, and I do not see the same things in the same way well, when that I, you do. All right, hold it, both of you. Richard, one quick question for you. Yep. You worked in network TV. You were with Walter Cronkite. You were actually at the network when all of this occurred. Hypothetically, Richard, 
Could we have faked it? Uh, you know, everything Jim says is plausible, except for this key point, and I'm going to answer your question. How did we fake the zero gravity? We have hundreds of hours of astronauts floating, sending soup cans and flashlights and, you know, bananas and every other conceivable consumable back and forth in the command module, in the lunar module. On the night of the Apollo 13 tragedy, I was sitting at uh, the broadcast center there on, on 57th Avenue, uh, 57th Street, and looking at the live shot from the Lovell TV downlink of the tape recorder, the little cassette tape recorder, rotating slowly in front of the windows of the lunar module with the moon out those triangular windows, and this tape recorder is hanging in zero gravity. James, how the hell did they do that? Richard, I'm afraid that I'm about to deal you a crushing blow. The Apollo 13 is one of the absolute proofs that it was a fraud, and I'll tell you why. Question. I'll How did they simulate zero gravity? I'll give it to you right now. They did it in an airplane simulator, and I'll tell you what. You can only do 30 seconds. I know. At a time. I know. I'm going right? to tell you. I, when you get my video. There's a amount of money spent by Ron Howard on Apollo 13 to I know. film in tiny 30-second segments that footage in the so-called Vomit Comet. If we didn't. have literally hundreds of hours of zero gravity. I know. Well, give there me a break. There are airplanes in the world who will put Apollo hardware in to film, in quote, zero gravity, with realistic, you know, space views of Earth and Moon out the windows. All right, let me talk. Now, in the film that I have, which is NASA's film, I want to make that clear, it's NASA. They gave it to me. It's, a, it's supposed to be happening in real time with James Lovell on that ship. Uh, first of all, you see blue light coming in from the windows. There's no blue light in outer space. Ever heard of scattering? Uh, give me a break. All right. Dr. No, Jim, no. Have you ever heard of Rayleigh scattering? Why is the sky blue, Jim? Because there's atmosphere. No, it's because of the size of molecules interacting with wavelengths of light. Are you telling me the that blue light coming through that window is because there was a film of particulate matter from the crap floating around in the cabin creating a haze that did blue scattering just like an atmosphere on the window. All right, I'll give you that. Now, I went to, I videotaped the limb in both Houston and the limb in Washington. When you see it, you will see that the, uh, the uh, uh, hatch on the ceiling of the limb opens downward into the limb. That's the one that lands on the moon. And it, there's a rim around it. It's one inch. This is, a, this is above the ascent engine. Above the ascent engine, right. It's one inch thick. And then there's three feet from the, the, that hatch opening to the top of the ascent engine, the bell. Right. Now, in the Apollo 13 real NASA video, you will see James Lovell coming down, and there is a 12-inch silver cone coming down from the ceiling. One foot. It does not really exist in the limb. It was a fraud. And then he dives down the length of that 12-foot cone where the hatch is at the bottom of that Well, but how do you know cone. it's 12 no, inches? wait a minute. Listen to me. How do you know it's 12 inches? Because I can see he put his hand on it, and you can do the measurement yourself. When he comes down the cone, he puts his hand around the side of it. And then you, you do the measurement. It goes up to the ceiling. There is no cone in the real limb, Richard. And so when he comes down, he dives the length of the wait, cone. Wait, wait. wait the length the of the cone. cone. What? You know about the docking cone? Yeah, it isn't in there. The cone, the docking cone, is in the tunnel. The drogue is in the tunnel. It's not inside the. The drogue is not the is not the cone. There is no cone as you see this inside. And I'll, let me finish this. He dives down. There's only three feet in reality, and I show you this in the video because I go and, and I videotape a real limb, at three feet between the top ceiling and the top of the bell. He dives down seven feet, and he never touches the bell. His entire length of his six-foot body and another foot of the cone, there's no question it was a fraud. None whatsoever, and well, no one who's ever seen it no can doubt question. it. What? 
I happen to know that they used anamorphic lenses and that the distortion of those lenses... And no, the... Richard, you couldn't get your way out of this on a bet. I've shown this to enough people, and there's no one who doubts it. There's a silver cone. It was not the real limb, and you can see it. And the more you study that film, you'll see it was taken in two different configurations. It was taken at two different times in two different phony simulated limbs. And he has the door opening to the rear. I point that out. When the door opened to the side, the hatch doors came down to the left side. In the, in the phony uh, NASA video with Lovell there, it opens to the rear. I showed that to NASA. They don't deny it. It was a fraud. The entire Apollo 13. Now, let me tell you something about the movie. Uh, Jerry Kluger, who writes for Time Magazine, did the book on the Apollo 13 movie. In it, he says that they were in they were in the limb, and I measured the limb. The hatch between the command module and the uh, and the and the uh, uh, limb itself, where the drogue was inside there, and it, uh, was only 24 inches of clearance. They could not possibly have gotten through that at all with a ballooned up suit that Jerry Kluger said was so ballooned up four pounds of pressure per square inch in a vacuum that they couldn't move they had to waddle their arms it was like a kid in a in a in a, in a snow suit now I measured the inside of the limb the crew compartment which Kruger, uh, Kluger said was no bigger than a telephone booth and he's right I show you on the video I go to Houston and I measure it with Frank Hughes it's 24 inches from front to back and 36 inches wide. A man in a spacesuit facing front to the instrument panel with, a, with his backpack on is 24 inches. He's 12 inches and his backpack is 12. He's smack up against his nose, is up against the instrument panel, and his back is trapped to the back. Two men standing shoulder to shoulder are 54 inches wide and it was only 36 inches wide. They couldn't have moved. It was worse than a sardine can, but even worse. The instrument panel goes down in front of them to the mid thigh. And then the door starts, 32 inches from floor up to mid thigh and 32 inches wide, and the door opens in, Richard. And they, as soon as they, they had to blindly try and bend their knees in a suit they could hardly move in and try to open that hatch door blindly. And then when they opened it, it might have opened maybe an inch, and they couldn't get out of their own way, and they hmm. couldn't get out of the limb, and they couldn't get into the limb. And I challenge you or NASA or anyone else in Houston or Washington to disprove that. Well, if all you're saying is correct, then we're dealing with a bunch of idiots. We're dealing with a bunch of idiots who have okay. gotten away with this, and that's okay. why I want people to get this tape, and I want them to the go to their newspaper editors. Ask you is, what? The question I want to ask is as follows. If this is all true, if what you said is all true, right? then obviously somebody really screwed up big time. Big time. Because why didn't they make it big enough so it would all be plausible? That's exactly what Jerry Kluger said. He said, in quote, he says, and I, I have it on video. Maybe I take, it's because I videotape you're... Kluger's words, uh, Richard. It says, a little oversight at Grumman, he called it. Well, I happen to know a gentleman who has 3,000 hours as a test lunar module pilot at Grumman. His name is Ken Johnston. He never flew it on Earth. The and never I flew have on Earth. photographs of him in the simulations. In a spacesuit, yeah. in a pressure suit, all right? The limb never flew on Earth. Never. What they had to tell the astronauts, Richard, is, what, look, two things. They had to go to their wives and say, look, we're going to be guinea pigs. One, we're going to go through the Van Allen radiation belt, and if we don't got well, die, or get you yeah, you are. Hold, 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 hold it, hold it. Hold it. Gentlemen, 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 hold it a second. Uh, we're at the top of the hour again. Richard, I just want to ask you one more time, seriously now, a straight out on answer to the question, could we, you're the one who would know, could we have faked it, Richard? And the answer is no, because the zero gravity would get you every time. There's too much footage of zero gravity in ways that optically, not even Hollywood. I mean, I've, you, you and I have seen Maroon. Remember Maroon? Of course. It's bad footage. So they just orbited and came home. Correct, because, now look, here's what they had to do. They had to go to their wives. And you, you and I got wives, you know, and you, you know, good. I know go to Ramona wives. and say, look, look, Ramona, I got to, uh, they're going to make me a guinea pig twice, but I got the right stuff. One, I got to go through the Van Allen radiation belt. I could come home with chromosome damage, brain damage, 
cancer terminal, but we're going to test it. They're dropping the standards. We're going to test it, and they're telling us that aluminum is fine, and don't worry about it. And then when we get to the moon, we never flew the limb on Earth. It could never lift off in the Earth's gravity. We only sat in a penny arcade-type simulator, and so we're going to test it out there. And no, ever well, she, she, she probably asked me what was the pay. Jim, <laughs> right. Jim. that's exactly what she, they did say. What's the pay? <laughs> Jim, do you remember Apollo 9? Yeah. Well, Apollo 9 was the test of the lunar module in Earth orbit. I know, but they never flew it in a, in a gravity sense. It didn't fly in gravity anywhere, on the moon or here. And, uh, and Richard, how did it move horizontal to the moon's surface? I've asked Roman to show me any paperwork showing what type of jet propulsion moved it sidewards, and they don't have it. Well, they, you don't it have was, it. Look, look, it's like vector helicopter flight. If you tilt the thrust vector slightly forward or backwards, the object will float forward or backward. Because no, it the... will not. It will not. It had a gimbaled engine uh, on the bottom, and if it tilted it at all, it would have thrown that thing off balance and tipped it over. It was not if a helicopter. You are, it was a if hunk you of are junk. absolutely flat out wrong. No, you I'm not. Know your physics. No, my physics is absolutely correct, and you're wrong. That thing was a hunk of junk, unbalanced, and I haven't even given you the killer yet, Richard. I'm about to give you the killer that let's say none of this really mattered. And I think the public has heard enough here to know damn well that they didn't go to the moon, and I haven't even given you the killer. One of the things I want to tell you before I give it to you is that I have uh, 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 Frank Hughes on tape, NASA official, the guy who trained the astronauts, trained the astronauts. And I say to him, how did they get out of the limb if the door opened in? And there was no room. And I said, what was the procedure? What is the, you know, you, you told them when to piss. How did you, how, what was the procedure to get out? And he said, we left it up to them to figure it out for themselves. Huh. Okay, now, the killer here, Richard, because I, I, I've nailed the NASA officials on this, is the rover. First of all, the LEM itself never flew on Earth. They, they All they ever did was go into a simulator and, and pretend that, you know, what any kid can do in high school. And then they went there and they made this thing flow horizontal to the moon's surface. And there is no dynamics at all that will make this hunk of junk go horizontal. You I don't care what you say. wrong. Said. James, you are absolutely wrong. All right, well, we'll debate wrong. that in and one second. Like let me give you the rover, professor. and then we'll go back and I would like No, no, let, let Richard say yeah. something okay, and then go, go to the rover. Go ahead, go ahead. You know, you were making flat assertions based on your opinion as an authority. What I would like you to do is quote me documented sources. When you say the limb cannot pivot, it cannot tilt, it cannot use thrust vector control, give me a documented source or two sources. There is none. Or maybe better, even three. There is none. That's the whole point, Richard. When you try to go to Grumman, and I've done it enough, and say, give me what the what was the paperwork that convinced NASA to give you the contract to build this thing? What? It should have been, I say in my tape, it should have been in the, uh, the Nobel Prize should have been given to you guys. It should have been in every museum. What was the paperwork that shows how you could make this hunk of junk move sidewards on the moon's surface? And you see in the NASA video that it is moving considerably sideward. And you talk in their books, oh, move it a little this way, move it a little that way. It was impossible to do. It's All it ever was. You keep, you, make, you keep making these assertions. Demonstrate for me why it's impossible. Because just the normal physics of a rocket, all that thing was, was like a cork on a hose, or on a water coming out of a hose. The rocket was the hose, water, and the cork is Bobby on it. That's all it ever was, Richard, and it had a little hundred pound thrusters up at the top. If soon as you fired those thrusters off, it would have tipped it over right away. It would have pitched it over. There is no way it could have no, moved No, because the sideways. gimbaling allows the thrust vector to go through the center of no, gravity. No, as soon as that rocket gimbaled to any direction off of dead center, it would have tipped the, ro the, the ship in that direction, and it would have tumbled out of control. Well, you're making this as an assertion. But you're and not I'll hold it. that assertion all the way to the United States Congress, and if you can get any proof other than that, I'll take it, and I'll drop that assertion. 
Well, you keep making assertions as if it's proof, and it's not proof. It's an assertion. I know, but that assertion, that assertion, I'll stand on. I'll stick my knife in the cards. I'll put them on the table, Richard. And if you find me any documented proof anywhere that showed where NASA could show how that ship moved sideways, all right, and James. I got enough film showing it moving sideways. Right. Okay. Fair enough. You got film, uh, Richard. How could they have kept that thing stable in a horizontal movement? Because you're dealing with frictionless environments, all right? It did have a lot of 10,000 pounds of thrust, he's right, coming down. It was coming down in a forward direction. As it came down, it pitched over. That's what the little 100-pound thrusters are designed for. The key is in – have you ever tried to balance a, uh, a pencil on your uh, – uh, let's, let's say your index finger? Yeah. All right. Have you ever seen jugglers balancing, you know, large objects? The key is to keep the thrust vector through the center of gravity. That's what the gimbal nozzle on the engine was designed to do. It wasn't maintaining an attitude only using the 100-pound thrusters outside the windows. It was using thrust vector control by gimbling the entire engine so that with a little bit of tilt forward, you had a component of velocity in the forward direction, or sidewards, or even back if it was in a hover, like a helicopter. If you see a, a Bell helicopter tilting slightly, it can move backwards and forwards. There's no, there's no difference in force between rotor blades and rocket thrust in a vacuum, not provided in, it's under control. Richard, not in your wildest dreams are you uh, going to equate a rotor helicopter to that gimbaled in. And a gimbaled engine means if a person... Uh, Put your hand, your palm up straight with your fingers pointing at the ceiling and where the heel of your palm is, is the, 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 uh, the, the thruster engine and tilt it over a little bit and just think about it. At best it would push it in that direction upward except it's falling on its own weight. And so as soon as you gimbal the engine over, which means move it, it moves. It was also throttleable. Remember that? It doesn't make any difference. As soon as you cut the throttle down, it's just going to fall faster through the gravity. Who said you throttle it down? You throttle it up to increase the thrust. Because no, but then it, would have pushed it, vertical. then it would have pushed it exactly perpendicular to the, you know, draw a straight line. It would have pushed you know, it that way and shifted it over. This reminds me of arguments I used to have with Physics 101, when you talk about mechanical vectors and mechanical advantages and all that. I mean, this is basic, basic high school stuff. I Why know, Richard, doing this? Richard, and there's a lot of high school kids out there listening to me and saying you're Can damn you right, Richard, an and engineer. you're wrong. Can you find me an engineer who will look at the LEM design and tell me that he agrees with you? Yeah, I'll find you. Who? 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 You're writing a book. you got a video. Give me one name of one engineer will, who's putting his reputation the time and says this, this thing won't fly. Richard, I'm on the Art Bell Show with 10 million listeners, Simon and I want any show. person out there who will Simon disagree Nuka. with me to write me and Simon tell me what it is, Nuka. and I will put it in the video and put it in the book. But I have you not haven't found yet, it. have you? you? It is a valid question. Do you have any engineer that would back up what you're saying right now? No, I don't. Simon Newcomb, before the Wright brothers, who was a very prestigious representative of the U.S. government, wrote a definitive treatise why heavier-than-aircraft never could get off the ground. He was oh, proven wrong. Stuff. I know. I am saying, look, as far as I'm investigating, I am putting forth this challenge to anyone listening, and I'm willing to agree with you, Richard. If anyone out there, NASA, Grumman, or anyone else, can tell me what moved that ship horizontal 10, 12, I kept trying miles to tell you, you won't listen. You kept moon. telling me it's impossible. Someone who gives you the answer, you you, you know, James, I'll I, take I have come to the conclusion, we're now what? Art, we're about three and a half, four hours into this? Four and a half, almost. I have a feeling we're dealing with a person with a very closed mind. He no, has sir, a model, to accept it. Richard, he has I'm an willing... idea, and facts will not dissuade him I from trying to sell his idea to the American people. No, sir, I'm saying that anyone is out there that knows, including all the scientists listening, Before you come our... on a national show, wouldn't it have behooved you to find one or two experts? I mean, when I come on this show and represent incredible things, I bring an enterprise colleague, I bring an expert, I introduce strange people who we've never met to have colloquies with. 
you have brought no evidentiary proof of any of your assertions from anyone other than you. Give me a break, Richard. I said right in the very beginning, this is a beginning investigation. I put everything down that I had. I just told you. I've told the Art Bell audience. Well, I haven't even given you that. I haven't even Before given you. Before I went on the national stage, I spent five years doing my homework. Yeah, but you Before know. I opened my mouth about the lunar artifacts at Ohio State University, I spent four years. I'll tell, all right, I'll tell you somebody. The guy's name is Bill Casey. He is a rocket dyne, he's an ex-rocket dyne uh, technical writer who did the jet propulsion stuff for rocket dyne who built the jet propulsion. Now, is this the guy that wrote the book, We Never Went, Never to, the went moon? to the Moon? And he's suing James Lovell in court October This 7th. particular gentleman, I think, is very suspect. I, I, I would prefer you have an independent engineer. I'll take any one you got. Well, I'll no, take it's it, not and I'll tell you what, if anyone, you can get you it, have to provide documentation for your statement like I do. All right, I'll tell you what. Let me go on to the... We'll pass this point because I think the public has already heard it. I'm going to go to the killer one. I went to Boeing because Boeing put the little rover car on the moon. And I said, give me... Uh, uh, the, the, let me describe the, the limb is in two sections. It's the bottom section called the descent stage and the top section is the ascent. When it lands on the moon, the top stage blasts off and goes and comes back to Earth. Now, the bottom section is made like a tic-tac-toe. Picture a tic-tac-toe and then cube it. That's all the bottom is. And so if you take a tic-tac-toe and you connect the perimeter lines, you will have five squares and four triangles. In the center square is the jet thruster, is the jet in the middle square. You mean the descent engine? the descent engine, right. The four squares around it are where the fuel tanks are. The limb was put in one of the corner triangular sections. The limb was five feet, was ten feet long. The car was ten feet long. Uh -huh. The section is five feet high by six feet wide. The corner triangular section and only a couple of feet deep because it's a triangle, it's half a square. So it wasn't as big as the squares. Now, the limb could not fit into a 10-foot a ten car, can't fit into a 5-foot section. Do you know how they got it in? Well, they folded it. How did they fold it? Look at the engineering diagram. I did. At first, when I read NASA's stuff, it said they folded it in half. So I said, oh, well, there I lose. I can't do anything. I said, but the tires, if they folded it in half, in the middle of the chassis, there's a battery there, and there's the post sticking up that they drive it with. I said, all right, maybe they'll fold that down, but the tires would stick out the front, and the tires would stick out the back. And so uh, it, would, it would have stuck out. It wouldn't have fit into the Saturn rocket because it was tight. Uh, they couldn't let it rattle in there. It was tight in its compartment in the Saturn V. So then I went back to Boeing and I said, how could that be? And they said, no, no, uh, it was folded two and a half feet off the back, folded up and over under the chassis. Like put your palm flat and fold your fingers over, two and a half feet to the front, two and a half feet on the back. And the tires then folded up and over, forming a triangle. And therefore, now they're both over the center of the chassis and it would fit into the triangle because the tires coming up and folded in would form a triangle. Because you can't get rid of the tires. You have to fold them away from the side and up because it wouldn't fit in a well, triangle. Remember, they're not tires in the conventional I sense. know, but they're still, they're circular, and they have a, they look like a tire. You can't miss that. You'll and see they're it. deformable. They're very flexible. I know, but I got photos of that. They were wired And I show it in the video. I show what NASA shows it folded, and they're not deformable. They're there, and they're solid. So I said, well, okay, they can get in. And I thought about it for a while, and I studied the pictures, and I said, good Lord, there's equipment in the front of this car in the first two and a half feet. There's sink, heat sinks and all kinds of stuff sticking up 10 inches, filling the whole front of it. And there's a battery in the middle. I said, it couldn't fold in half because it's filled with equipment. The best it could do is a 90-degree angle forming a square U. The front folds 
uh, up and it stays straight up in the air because the equipment would hit the center part of the chassis and the back folds up and goes straight up in the air. And so I went to Houston and I got Frank Hughes to say on the video, when you get it, you'll hear him say, yeah, it folded on a 90 degree angle. You're correct. And what, what does that do? That leaves the tires sticking out the front three feet and the tires sticking out the back three feet. So you have a five-foot chassis with six feet of tires. It wouldn't have fit into the side of that thing on a bet. And I went to Houston and I asked NASA what they did. I said, give me any video, show me any picture, show me anything you've got showing that thing going into the side. And they said they've got nothing. And so did Boeing, and so did Grumman. All right. Let Richard consider that, uh, if you would, please. Somebody in San Jose writes, Bob in San Jose writes, some things that I can't repeat or wouldn't, but he says, when the gimbaled rocket fires on the limb, and yes, it does want to lift uh, or tilt over, rather, by physics, there are thrusters on the top that are controlled by an inclinometer unit. The more it wants to tilt over, the more thrust countering the leaning... Uh, a moving a movement, uh, thus giving it a size sideways thrust. Anybody can figure that out. No, wrong. All it does is keep it from tipping over. It doesn't move it sidewards at all. All right, Richard, I want to hit you with something now, and that is the following. Um, the one, the only reason you said that they could not have faked the whole thing was there were too damn many hours of weightless activity. Uh, suppose you take the contention of uh, Mr. Collier that the Saturn V and all the rest of them did nothing but orbit, that would give them lots of hours of weightless uh, footage. Yeah, but how do you get weightless footage with the moon in the background? I, I, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I was just throwing that and in. Well, believe me, the state-of-the-art of motion pictures, Kubrick notwithstanding, in 1969 was not adequate to fake what we have seen on these films. Now, I have probably spent, as, as an individual, more time looking at film and, and still photos of the moon than perhaps almost anybody else in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the country. You know, I've spent literally years. And even notwithstanding the presence of the artifacts, the fact is that a meticulous examination of these photographs proves to me two things. One is we did go there and took real pictures of an extraordinary place and NASA also very artfully tried to hide a lot of interesting things we found by doing a whole combination of things, including putting out absolute fake pictures. My problem with Jim is not that there's a, there's a, there's a weird mystery here. It's that Jim is focused on the trivial mystery how as you opposed get, to the big mystery. How you get the lamb and the rover into the side of the lamb. But you see, you keep focusing on, 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 you know, almost inconsequential details. Why is that inconsequential? Well, you, if you couldn't get it to the moon, how did it get on the moon and how did they get pictures but of it? But the fact is you are claiming, again, that you have proof that one guy told you it folded one way, produced for me a Boeing engineer, produced for me a blueprint, produced for me an actual template of how they claim they did it. I got it. It's on the video. It's on the video. It's on the video. And the source is from? NASA. No, there is no NASA. It's from, uh, from, uh, from NASA did Boeing. did build from, the lunar rover. Yeah, Boeing from, did. Boeing, right? yeah, I got it from Boeing. I got the pictures showing when it folded in half and it couldn't. It was a fraud picture. You can see it. There's no equipment on the thing that they got folded in half. None. There's no battery, no seats, no heat sinks, nothing. When That's you why say, I went When you say you have a picture, do you have a picture from the PR department or an actual engineering blueprint? They don't have engineering blueprints that they'll give you, and I do have schematics, yes. And so instead of, uh, 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 yeah, I got schematics. I got them here. I got them from Grumman. They're from Bowie. All right. I want to interject something here. Try this one out, either one of you, to Art and to the gang from West Thomas. I was a Grumman human factors engineer responsible for videotaping the lunar module cold flow facility for training purposes. This was at Grumman behind Plant 5 in Bethpage, where Richard did his simulations. Cold flow refers to the cryogenic systems on the lunar module. It became obvious there was no coordination between the various engineering departments, no overall test concept, so there was no way for me to produce a meaningful training tape. In other words, 
There was no way I could see for the lunar module propulsion system to actually work. In 1969, when we watched Apollo 11 land, I was in Planet 5 with the engineering team. We all turned to each other and said, how the blank, oh, you can imagine the word there, how the blank did they do that? We were totally amazed. Any, no. any, any comments, Richard? Well, the obvious comment is I know Wes Thomas, and I'm just a tad suspicious of that fact, okay? Okay. I've yeah, known I know, Wes Thomas for 20-some years. You mean uh, you're, you're suspicious of uh, his, his claim of where he was, or no, no, what? No, I'm suspicious of his representation of that incident. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the public can hear it. They couldn't fit the, the rover into the side of the limb that made Apollo 15, 16, and 17 a total fraud because it was never there. And, uh, and you uh, see, Jim, you, can, you understand there were different limbs for different blocks. No, they were all, I checked that with Grumman. They were all the same limb because they would have had to change the Saturn rocket configuration if they changed the limb, and they never did it because the limb fit so tightly into it so it wouldn't vibrate to death. And therefore... It had to have fit properly into this corner, and it didn't do it. It was 11 feet long when it folded on a 90-degree angle with the tire sticking out the front and the back, and NASA has not denied it. And you can't get away from that. You couldn't. It's case closed. Well, it's not case closed just because you say so. I know. We happen let to the have public, a source well, What I'm saying is let the we public happen, decide. Jim, Jim, we happen to have a very good source at Boeing who flew 3,000 hours in the lamp. Or his name is Ken Johnston. What do you mean in the simulator? That's what I mean. I know, but that's not the limb. The limb is what went to the moon. Do the wild thing. It's 702-727-1295. Look, no, 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 no. I'm telling no, there's you. There's the first time I had to hit the button. Now, I you, know, I'm you, sorry that's, that's that. a word I you got used emotional about that, and I know you got the button. I got that. the FCC. Come on, Jim. Yes, I'm sorry, but I got emotional about that because I'm not arguing semantics. I'm telling you there is a major fraud and that Richard Hoagland is trying to protect his position that people built glass houses on a place where God throws stones. I don't buy it whatsoever. Well, see, that's your prejudice. I you know, I understand that. that. You, you are I understand asking that, us, but that's Jim, all you're Jim, protecting, Richard. Mr. Collier, you are asking us to believe that there is a major, fundamental, fascinating, fantastic conspiracy for stealing 20 plus billion dollars from the American people and perpetuating the greatest fraud in history. That's correct. Right? That's that what is claiming. correct, and I'm asking the people that's what, to... Wait, that's what you're claiming. Yes. All right. Uh, it's a good question, Richard. Uh, and then uh, th let's follow up. Uh, Mr. Collier, why? Because they didn't have the technology to go. Then why the did we go? Why did we the lamb never flew and couldn't fly. They couldn't get through the Van Allen belt, and they didn't want to lose $30 billion because of the great money. Why, why would we commit to doing something that we couldn't do? What because was the there's a lot of money in it, and you can fool the American people like glass domes on the moon. Wait, wait, wait. There is so much more money to be made on black projects where there is no accountability, there is no congressional oversight, there aren't any Jim Colliers asking pesky questions. Nobody asked in those days. We sweep it under the rug, and it amounts to ten times the Apollo budget. You were there, Richard Hoagland, when they had the limb in that time and you never asked once how that limb fit into the side and I'm saying that all the science writers from the Washington Post, the New York Times and everybody else, nobody asked and I'm telling you it didn't fit and if it didn't fit all of you were derelict or you knew and I don't know what your particular thing is here but I'm telling you right now that the American public has been stolen from and cheated Jim, by NASA for bit, money. You sound a bit like Simon Newcomb Oh, well. Who proved the Wright brothers could not fly. On oh, paper. that, listen, flat earther and Wright earther, I'm giving you facts and people can hear it. No, and you're giving, giving us rhetoric. opinion. No, the I'm telling you, it did not fit into the side. It, it, just if that's all we ever used is that the rover could not fit into the side, it is not my opinion. It is a fact. That does not prove we didn't go to the moon. They didn't take the rover there, which made Apollo but 15, 16, and 17 a fraud. that equivalent to not going to the moon? Well, I don't care. That may be true. Now, no, I'll, no, no, now no, 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 no. This is a very important point because it is my contention that NASA went to the moon ah. and they've lied up, sideways, down, I've, backwards. Now, now I'll Jim, that would point you stop you. talking over me? Right. Please stop talking over me. To you now. What yeah. I want to know from NASA 
is why they have lied about details of an extraordinary project, including what we found. What right. you seem to be focused on is hanging them for never doing it at all and avoiding looking at the evidence. You have a prejudice against glass houses on the moon yes. because you obviously not looked at the evidence. On I've our seen, website. I've seen your video. On it's... our website tonight. I, I, I got put your up, video. What? Please I've don't got talk about right, let, let Richard get his website business out of okay, here. Go ahead, go ahead. On our website tonight, I had Keith put up stills from the Apollo 10 footage of Earthrise seen over Mare Smythe during the Apollo 10 May 1969 mission. It is the most astonishing sequence of video, frankly, that I have found in the entire Apollo sequence. It shows an Earth rising over an airless body, visibly distorted, becoming less so as it rises higher, exactly as the moon appears distorted when it sets or rises behind the atmosphere of the Earth. The problem is it isn't symmetrically distorted. It is asymmetrically distorted. It is geometrically being refracted. The light is being bent. And I've got several sets of images up tonight on the website, which is available through Art Bell's website, because mm -hmm. there's a link, That's right. showing this detailed time-lapse footage taken by the 60-millimeter DAC camera that was mounted in the window of the lunar module. If we never went to the moon, James, how did that sequence of photographs get back to Earth? And the answer is? The answer is probably whatever you claim, if there was a man in that ship, I don't, I don't know that that's true. All I can do is give the people the... See, every time we put a piece of evidence out there, you dismiss it. I don't it. know. Never I, went. They may this have is a circular Richard, reasoning. This Richard, whole there may be life, James, almost, James, almost pointless. James, he's... he's He's right. You're not giving a specific answer. He gave you a I don't have that problem. answer because I haven't seen what he, he's got there, and I don't know that it isn't some kind of graphics. I can't prove it because I haven't investigated it. I don't know that answer. The same as you don't know the answer of how a civilization built glass houses on the moon without a factory to convert to silica. Who said they didn't have a factory? Uh, where is the factory in your pictures? The moon is 15 million square miles. Well, okay. So, listen. I, you know, I, I read your Edward, uh, you know, your uh, astronaut thing. Who was the guy, Ed Mitchell? And you didn't have the answer then. So I don't know. You uh, to build a glass house on a moon where 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 it's pulverized by uh, meteorites. I don't buy it. But you know, it's the same. At least well, wait, 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 wait. you're supposed to be a journalist. What do you mean you don't buy it? I mean, you're prejudiced like that. No, no, I am willing to exist. accept. I said, I'll, I'll yield you that. And I'm willing to go and challenge NASA. And if you've got, if your video and all that that you're doing. But, but then the up. question, Jim, if you're willing to do that, how did we get this data? Who took the Hasselblad pictures? I have I have no idea whether pan, it was Hasselblad pictures. Who took the metric camera photos? Who took the pan photos? I'm telling you that. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know. Sequence. Maybe it was maybe it was taken just robotically. No, because you know, by the technology that were sent out there without as, as as you have investigated thoroughly the problem of the Blivet, the rover in the lunar module. Right. I have investigated very thoroughly with lots of experts, many of whom have appeared on this show, the problem of the photography of the moon, how it was transmitted back, the lunar orbiter, unmanned robotic television camera, facsimile kind of, of, of uh, technology, versus the Apollo, literally brought back by astronauts, taken in situ, all of that. So I know the sequence of how these photos were taken as well as anyone can. I know, but and Richard, I know there had to be a man behind the damn camera taking the pictures we've been looking at. Richard, the one thing we got to do. So is how did the man get there? None of us have seen. I mean, some people have seen your stuff, and whatever the stuff is, it isn't out into public consumption. What I'm saying about what I've got, and was it only a paper moon video? Is demonstrable stuff. The limb doesn't fit. The rover. Uh, the limb doesn't fly. The rover doesn't fit. They can't go beyond the Van Allen belt. They never threw anything up in the air to show anti -gra that gravity was one six. They never videotaped the moon, the Earth from the moon. Uh, James, all uh, of those things are easily, uh, you know, you got to give those answers. And if I can get those James, answers, James, yes, um, here's what I think we ought to do since we're coming toward the end of the time. Right. Uh, you have presented certain very interesting questions, and 
maybe one of them is a stopper. What I would suggest to you is to send what evidence you have to Richard Hoagland. Yes. In the form of your tape, let him examine it. Right. To you, I suggest that you go up onto the web and look at the photographs he's got up there.